morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Finance Committee, our budget uh, session for this evening. It's going to include the Community Development Department, um, Leisure Services, which includes the Library and Parks and Recreation, as well as Human Services. And then we are going to um, go through our Capital Improvement Program, uh, the TIP districts, as well as the Capital uh, Budget items. Uh, before I recognize the uh, manager, I just want to ask, has everybody had a chance to review the minutes of the 18th and minutes of the 22nd? And if you have, you want to, to move those? So moved. Second. second. Motion made and second to, let's do one at a time, just in case. Uh, so, um, Council Todd moves, second by... Um, <coughs> Council right. Pierce, sorry. Mm -hmm. when, when I, that's why I was drinking. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's anyway, fine. We those, did it. those two yeah, guys, the good-looking yeah. guys yeah. over yeah. there. Uh, move uh, the adoption of the May 18th minutes. Uh, any comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have motion adopted. Uh, the minutes of the 22nd is also uh, moved and seconded by the good-looking guys over there in Board 1 and 2. And um, you can tell it's like the end of a work day. I'm like, oh, yeah. right. how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there any uh, comments, uh, changes, questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The minutes of the May 22nd have <coughs> also been approved. So with that, I will recognize the manager, and I'm assuming you're going to take us to... Um, Community, Community Development on Development. page 133. Thank you very much. So that is item number four of your attachments, and after we go through all of the... Um, these pieces here, the, the mayor mentioned, then I'll turn it over to Matt Walsh and he'll do the uh, tax and government financing districts and the capital budget. So on page, item number four, page 133 for community development, uh, revenues budget to budget are up $105,000 or 6.8%. Uh, construction permits are up $88,000. Other permits are up $9,000. Licenses are down $5,000, just, just slightly uh, uh, for those items. Uh, street damage fees are up $5,000. Review fees are up $40,000. Inspection fees are down $31,000. Timber sales are down $13,000. Transfers in from trust is up $11,000. Expenses budget to budget are up $624,000 or 15.3%. This increase is due to a number of factors, which include, you recall, we moved the economic development marketer and um, <coughs> director redevelopment and downtown services position and associated costs from the city manager's budget to the community development department as the uh, revised positions approved by the city council at their April city council meeting. That is $265,000 for that, for that move. Restoration of the senior engineering tech position $88,000, increased overtime in engineering, $12,000, increased the labor grade for the GIS coordinator position due to really market conditions, $14,000, uh, upgraded the assistant city planner position, $3,000, increased hours for the trails and open space ranger position, $3,000, increased uh, funding for professional development dues and training, $11,000, Increased professional services, $45,000, mainly for increased contract services for plan reviews and construction inspections. Increased the transfer out to the trust uh, highway reserve to align with the street damage fee revenue. So the street damage fee revenue comes in and gets transferred out to uh, the highway reserve. We'd be glad to answer any questions. First question, Councilor Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. City Manager, last night uh, in these chambers, the uh, uh, SEAC committee met, uh, actually that's redundant because C is SEAC is, is committee, but SEAC met and uh, discussed one of its recommendations which was for a sustainability director for the city. And we noted that in the uh, report on the new positions within community development, uh, there was a director of special projects and strategic initiatives position and in the report that we received in uh, April, I believe, when we voted on this and approved the, re the restructuring, um, part of the charge for that position was uh, to lead and manage the city's efforts relative to energy and sustainability. That's the language that was in the That's report. Correct. I was wondering if you could expand upon uh, kind of how you envision that part of this individual's uh, job to be performed and kind of you know what your thinking is about giving 
that charge to that position. Sure. So the um, the idea is that there's, there's really a couple paths we could go forward on this because it makes sense to have uh, staff focused on sustainability. I've seen other I've seen places where it's you know part of the uh, planners director you know, directory position. Uh, they'll call it a city planner slash sustainability coordinator. There's elements for that because if you look at what goes into uh, what Heather Shank is is working on for the Code Next project, sustainability really, you know, there's this forward-looking sustainability. How are we designing our roads and streets and, and and developments and how those projects happen in coordination with each other? So there's, that's a very large part of it. But it's also the the built infrastructure that we have now. And so so at this point where we are in our evolution, so to speak, would be I my expectation is that every single department has inculcated within it people looking at sustainability issues. So when the um, when the pumps are being changed out at the wastewater treatment plant, they're going to variable speed pumps to save energy. When uh, when Marco Philippon is redesigning the the uh, the water um, booster station, station number four at the uh, the water plant, he's looking at sustainability issues. So when if we do a um, um, a new uh, Beaver Meadow Golf Course clubhouse. It, we look at it's designed as part of that. So I think every department needs to be focused on that, but there needs to be a resource for those folks to be able to go to who, who, uh, who know something about this. I think each department now has a good standing about what we're doing. So uh, so when Brian was working, Brian LeBron, the deputy city manager for finance, was working on the LED street lighting program, he understood the finance piece, but he also understood the sustainability piece. But I also I wanted to add a person who was going to be up to speed on this from a, uh, from a grant standpoint, from a, uh, a resource standpoint, where people who don't do projects all the time or do changes all the time will go to someone who has that skill set in them. Eventually, that could translate into a position. But I, at this point, I don't think it makes sense to have a energy czar who uh, who is is separated from the departments um, essentially telling the departments how they need to be doing what they need to be doing I think it simply needs to be a resource and there's plenty of other if you look at the job description all these job descriptions are online there's specific other duties that are associated with this position and I think that's where we are as, as an organization if you wanted to add more people you know you can add more people uh, but I think I, I was trying to look at it from a uh, financial sustainability, no pun intended, approach also. Right. Follow up, Yara. Thank you. So what I'm hearing you say is that this is the person who would be available to write grants to capture federal funds mm -hmm. to uh, uh, advance our sustainability goals. Right. And I, but in, in reality, I think in the beginning, it's going to be, there's going to be ones that don't fit directly in, inside city departments. But when Dan Discal, Dis 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 Driscoll runs the, at the wastewater treatment plant is putting together grant applications for the solar field down at uh, at Hall Street. I want him to be the driver and this and this these people to be the resource because in reality it's going to be the people who are actually running the facilities and managing those on a day to day. That's where we're going to see the savings. That's where we're going to see the and the environmental improvements that go along with that. That's that's the approach that I've, I've, I'm recommending. Great, thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, Mr. City Manager, just um, going off of building off what uh, Councillor Champlin said during our meeting last night, we talked about the different ways that we could achieve uh, greater sustainability uh, within the committee with the people that we have available. And I noticed there are funds for professional development. And I'm wondering if there are already workshops, committees, or trainings that our current staff members attend that focus specifically on sustainability issues. There are there are conferences and and work that they go and trainings that they go to that those are an element set of it but not just those there might be there might be some and there might be some available but right now um, this is this is something that again if you go to any when the fleet manager goes to a conference regarding fleet energy savings and environmental impacts are always part of those things so that's that that's going to be a natural part of that. Your Honor. Would you consider allowing um, different staff members to attend um, workshops or conferences specifically on sustainability just so they can network and make those connections within 
the Granite State that are dedicated towards sustainability? Yes, I've done them myself. Excellent. Great. There was one just recently in Portsmouth where we did one on uh, the Portsmouth's big concern, of course, is the co being on the coast yeah. and the coastal pieces, but there's also a very large energy piece associated with that. So okay. I, I think leading by example is the way to do it. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get up to speed on it. I expect my staff to also. Okay. Any further community development? Okay. We'll do a hearing. That's good How would you like to do it? Let's just do it after each one. That way we okay. can. Um, does anybody wish to testify on the community development budget? Mr. Swiker. Good evening, mayors and members of the city council. I'm Roy Schweiker, and this is your chance for a very unusual thing. I'm actually going to propose you spend more money. <laughs> and this relates to... I was at the zoning board meeting earlier this month, <coughs> and all our procedures essentially are designed to benefit the applicant. You know, one might think that we would assume that our zoning code was correct, and therefore it would, you know, be assumed to be correct, and the applicant would have to prove things. It's kind of the other way around, that the applicant's assumed to be correct the way the procedures work, and at that meeting, 100% of the requests for variances were approved. And one of the issues that I see is that if you have an item that comes before the planning board, the planning staff, you know, gets to enter in on this and make recommendations and so forth, but that doesn't seem to be true for the zoning board. And so what I'm going to suggest is that the same thing should be there, that every variance that's requested, the planning staff reviews what has been asked for, justify why the zoning code, you know, ordinarily forbids this and recommends, you know, whether this is a good idea or a bad idea or whatever. And some of this is going to be boilerplate, you know, justifying where things come from and why that's in the code. And some of it's going to be related to the specific thing. And mm -hmm. I'll give you an example that one applicant came in and they wanted a building that was more than twice as long as what the zoning allowed. And the applicant said, oh, that's in the zoning code because a you know, side of a building that long is ugly, but we're going to put uh, decorations on it so it won't be ugly. And so the zoning board approved it. They didn't even make any particular requirements for the decorations. And my feeling is I'm not sure that's the only reason why that's in the zoning ordinance, but, you know, the, the planning staff didn't have a chance to comment. So I think that you know, they need to review everything and they need to specify you know, why that is in the ordinance and you know, what you might be losing by approving this. And yes, that's going to cost money, but that's what I said. This is actually something I'm recommending more money for. On the other hand, if you want to save a lot of money, you could abolish the entire zoning code and just get rid of the planning department because if the zoning board is going to approve everything that comes in, then there's really no need to have a zoning code at all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Swigger? Seeing none. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Community development? Okay. With that, we'll close the public hearing. Mr. Manager. Hey, members of the council, uh, the next section you want to be in is item number five. library and you'll want to be on page 139 to start with uh, revenues budget to budget are up by eleven thousand dollars or five percent fines for overdue books are up two thousand um, dollars transfer in again this is budget to budget uh, transfer in from trust is up four thousand dollars Expenses budget to budget are up $120,000 or 5.9% due mainly to uh, changes in wages and benefits, so the contracts that we've entered into. Uh, the library books materials, so, so that was $84,000. Library books materials, $16,000. Electricity, $17,000. Be glad to answer any questions. Any questions on the library budget? 
Ms. Brown. Yes, thank you. Mr. City Manager, last year's budget included 18,000 for library programming, mm -hmm. but I do not see that in this year's budget. I'm wondering if uh, <coughs> it's, if you can speak to that. Sure. I think the programming is under, let's see if I can find it here. Professional development, sorry, professional services. Yep, $11, right yes, it's this, thank you, Brian. Um, it's um, same amount as last year, same funded. It just it falls under the professional services category. So it's, it's exactly the same amount because I, I put it in last year. I thought it was a good idea, so I didn't. I want to cut myself. Uh, it was very successful. So I, I think so. I, it gives them the ability to plan yep. instead of, you know, waiting for dollars to come in and then doing something. So this can, they could do it a year out in advance. Excellent. So it seems to work well. So I just left it alone. Thank you. I just I could didn't yeah, see sure. it, and I just thank you for sure. clarifying. Anyone else? Go Fizzy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. <coughs> um, last year we uh, approved some funding for the e-bikes, and I uh, just wondered how that uh, programming has gone. Sure. Could I ask the library? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm the assistant director at the library, Matt Bowes, and I have our youth services manager, uh, Becky Caston, with me. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question, actually, because that's one of our more exciting programs that's going on. Um, we were able to launch in October of last year, which is a little bit later than we wanted to, but we got out to, I'd say, about 10 to 12 different locations. Um, we saw hundreds of people, actually. We went to Halloween Howl. Uh, it was a, a great thing to be doing. Um, and this year, we're off to a good start. We've already been to White's Park. Um, we were at the S&W annual bike swap the other day. Um, talking to lots of people in the community. It's a great opportunity just to spark conversations and, and teach people about what the library has to offer and what community services are out there. Um, Becky, do you want to add anything since you've been such a key part of this project? Too? I, you know, two things. One, um, I feel like people ask us about it a lot. They've been asking us for our schedule. Where are you going to be? Where, you know, like, when are you going to be out? So that's really nice. They're anticipating <laughs> us uh, being there. And I'll just mention, uh, Matt and I both went up to NHLA is the Library Association's meeting here in New Hampshire. We have it um, yearly, and we had a chance to speak about it with other librarians in the state. They were super excited about it. So that to us was also nice to be able to be one of the um, kind of on the forefront of that program, and it's such a good outreach tool that people were very excited about it. So anyhow, it's good. Thank you for your support for it because it, it really is a nice program for us, and it helps us reach so many people that um, don't know about us for one reason or another and don't get to us uh, gives us a lot more reach um, as a library. So yeah, I'll just add one of our goals this year is to reach every ward with our outreach um, with the e-bike service. So we're going out to the parks, the pools, um, major events that happen in town. Uh, there's lots of opportunity here in Concord to get out there. So. And we've had really good success with a lot of partnerships. Um, the Parks and Rec Department has been so nice to work with and um, we were at SNW. This past weekend, they were having their big bike swap, and so we were there, and um, it was really nice to see the community and um, just have that chance to interact. Great, thanks. Any further questions? Brown. I just would like to ask, is there a way that we can find out where the e-bike will be if we want to bike to it or follow along? Yep, so we do have a page on our website um, that you can find, and we have linked a calendar in there. Um, we're just getting started, kind of filling that calendar out, so there's not a lot there yet, but we've had lots of uh, inquiries about wanting the bikes places, and we have a lot of in-house plans already. So you can check that calendar out and see where we're going to be. And we've been talking a lot about how to get the word out. You know, it's funny, um, Matt had posted, we were at White... Um, White's Park the other day, and um, I had a patron this morning stop by. She said, I saw that you posted you were there, and I came right over, but we had posted at the end of our visit, so I think we need to post at the beginning of our visit so people can come and find us. So. Let's talk. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have a, <clears throat> a comment and then just a quick question, uh, and it's about the Library of Things. 
the comment is, how cool is that? Because um, I, just, I just wanted to, I, I think it's really uh, innovative and I just want to generally compliment the, you and the rest of the library staff and the library director who's not here, but uh, for, uh, you know, staying on the cutting edge really of this, these kinds of innovations, I think they're really creative. The question I have is, is do, uh, do you have a sense overall of how popular the library of things has been, how successful that's been so far? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good, another good question. Uh, so it's been really well received, and it's really interesting to see what people find the most um, popular. You know, one of our m more popular items is a paper shredder. I mean, you w who would have thought? You know, we've got other items that we thought would be really more interesting, but no, the paper shredder's out the door. Um, but, you know, we've got a metal detector. We have... Um, so a tax season. That's right. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, we've got a, a slide scanner. So a lot of people, you know, you have those old slides in the attic, family um, pictures you don't want to lose, um, that sort of thing. So these really uh, unique items that you don't want to go out and buy for a one-time use, but are, are great to borrow from your library. Um, and libraries all around the country are doing this. This is not just a <coughs> trend here in New Hampshire or anything. But um, we jumped right on board because it saw the value in it, and I um, appreciate that support. And we're expanding that. Um, Nora Cascadden, who's one of our technical service people, was up in my office um, today, and we were talking about um, in the kids department, we have these um, backpacks that kids can check out. Um, we're about to launch that, and they're full of um, some developmental toys along with like, board books and things that um, sort of uh, give families, and especially with young children, um, it's, they're called lit kits, and they're going to be part of our library of things. So it kind of expands, especially for families that are strapped for resources. They're they're really nice, um, easy to check out things. The kids can take them away with a little backpack. So <coughs> anyhow, that that collection is is growing. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. I'm not going to put Matt on the spot on this, so I'll ask the city manager uh, from from. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you two guys are so full of energy that I'm ready to go home and go to sleep right now. But, uh, but that's great, because libraries are wonderful. I grew up in libraries, my, t my little town library in Rhode Island where I grew up. My question is this, um, you know, uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, we hear folks in, in Pentecook and folks on the Heights talk about the desire for extended hours, more hours uh, in those branch libraries. And I wondered, and I also, at the same time, have had seniors come to me and say, gee, I would volunteer. I would." You know, if it, if it meant we could extend hours, I would be willing to volunteer. Have we ever looked at the possibility of using volunteer senior retirees uh, to uh, help extend the hours that our branch libraries are open? How many, uh, could you tell me how many aides we have, how uh, many volunteers we have now? Um, Not specifically for extending hours, but. Right, you, right. It's probably in the neighborhood of 10, would you say, I Becky? Think, I think we have seven because we just had um, Volunteer Appreciation Week, right. so I just went and bought um, <laughs> little gifts for them. So I'm pretty sure it's seven or eight. Plus, we have three um, high school volunteers that come in and help us in, up in the kids. Primarily manage the book sale. Yeah, so we do we do use volunteers a lot. There actually was a lot more. I'm going, if I'm pre COVID. Back like pre COVID. Yeah. And a lot of folks who re retired uh, actually donated a tremendous amount of time. That, that went away um, through for safety purposes, for their own for their own health. Um, and I could I see that eventually coming back. But it is something we could do. What we, we've been trying to look at is what is the demand? Trying to get a handle on what the demand for what because we don't want to just be open and have nobody come in. So right. if if we knew that uh, people wanted uh, something to be open, you know, a Thursday afternoon. We could tailor something to that. We could we could either rework the existing schedule or add hours to that. But so far, the we, unless you guys have seen something different, I have not seen that go in because I I had envisioned when we opened the the Br Heights branch and when we opened the new library up in Pentecook that we you know it'd be great to add three or four hours every single year until you get to the maximum amount that you want to be at. But the demand really hasn't been there yet, and I think it's probably because we're still coming out of uh, COVID or have just come out of COVID and people are still discovering the, the library and, and what the resources are. So follow up. You want it? Thanks. Um, I would just suggest that there might be, you know, informal ways to survey. Uh, the Pentecook Village Association is a great resource in Pentecook. Uh, there's a, you know, a Heights community a Facebook page. Uh, you know, the community organizations active. Uh, you know. We've contacted the, the different communities, particularly on the Heights, 
and they ju it just hasn't it hasn't um, there hasn't been that demand for the additional hours. It, it to me really it isn't a matter of the money. The, 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 this is short dollars. Okay. But it's just a matter of really they ha they have the same issues that uh, Parks and Rec has, which is getting the staffing in place, as you said. Uh, and maybe we can do some of it with volunteers, but yeah. it would be nice. I, I think it'd be fabulous if we could add hours to it. Uh, we'll follow up. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. Particularly. <laughs> Particularly on the heights, I mean, we have a, a lot of uh, folks a, at uh, Heritage Heights. Uh, and we have uh, volunteer organizations within Heritage Heights who are looking for things to do. So I would just suggest that the library, you know, try to connect with those groups and, and continue to look at ways to identify when would be the optimal times and how, how we could expand and those. And I think hours. next year when you see the fiscal year 25 budget, you'll, you'll need to start budgeting dollars for the additional services up in, in Pentecook. So I think you'll see that. So it would be a good time to figure out what, what's the appropriate starting amount of hours there. It doesn't have to be what's already in place. It can be something different. Right. So. Great. Thank you so much. Council Brown. Thank you. I just, uh, obviously our library is very popular. Um, we have a lot of things to offer. And <laughs> I noticed the non-resident library fees is 7500 How much does it cost for a library card if you are not a Concord resident? Yep. It's um, $55 for six months um, or $100 for the year. Uh, there is a senior rate as well. Um, I believe that's 45 and 75. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, we'll see you, uh, recreation and then uh, we'll have public hearing. Okay. Okay, so for recreation, you want to be on item number six. Parks and Recreation, uh, you'll be on page 143. <coughs> budget to budget revenues overall are down um, $137,000 or 10.8%. This is mainly due to reduction of $195,000 from the transfer in that was used to offset expenses associated with the new community center. So think of this as money that was coming in from reserve to, so, so if you take that piece off, which is a one time, really not a one time piece, but a, uh, temporary piece uh, is actually doing uh, quite well, uh, doing well. Um, revenue changes are camps are up $27,000, program fees are up $32,000, other service charges are up $4,000, and rental income is down $7,000, and that's not due to uses, just due to reduction in, the, in what we were um, taking in as rental income per, per use. Expenses budget to budget are up $407,000 or 11.4%. And that is the next page. And that's due to the addition of a full-time employee at the cemetery, that's $71,000. Tree service work for $20,000. Uh, seasonal temp wage increases. So all, if you think of all the temps at the, for park and recreation and the cemeteries, which is in park and recreations, $80,000, electricity, $10,000, and the remainder of the increase is mainly due to the wage and benefit changes through the contracts. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Those questions in Parker Rec. Council Pierce. Um, Mr. City Manager, revenue from the rental of lights or for usage of lights, where is that? On, is that on the revenue page? That would be rental income it's included. So it's, um, I'm sorry, be, uh, yeah, rental income is in that total. Okay. So for example, uh, I'll give you, um, you know, that's everything from adult, adult softball leagues, baseball, legion, Bishop Brady High School, all those pieces are. All right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's Council Brown. Yes. I'm wondering um, if there's a line, I, maybe I didn't, I missed it, uh, for non-Concord uh, residents who use the programs. I don't, uh, so program, so program revenue. <coughs> or I, I believe they have to pay extra if they use the pools or they do. I, you, was, I was standing at the counter when someone came in to play pickleball and they had to pay a non-resident rate. Right. But I think for, for like, you're thinking like programs like yoga classes and things like yep, that. Yep. I'm just wondering if I we have a line item that shows um, yeah, I, I funds do. from uh, non-residents. Let me ask. No, we don't have anything like that at all. Sort of leading the witness there. 
He'll change his mind. He'll figure out by the time he gets up here. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, that's wrapped into the program fees and the camp fees. Um, we can pull out the data for residents and non-residents if we had to. We just don't have that broken down in the budget. But it's all wrapped into one. It's usually for programs. It's usually ten, ten to fifteen dollars more for a non-resident. Um, they pay a non-resident pool pass. It's one hundred and twenty-five dollars a month uh, for the season. Mm -hmm. um, so we do charge drop-in, you know, basketball or futsal. Non-residents pay another extra dollar. Um, just. So much of what we do is supported by concrete taxes, so it's try to pass that a, a little expense on. Yeah. That's great. Other questions? <coughs> Council Fennessy, and before I recognize you, just can you pull the mics up a little bit so people can hear? Sure, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> um, this is actually for uh, Mr. Gill. Um, I know that uh, the, the council passed a reduction in fees at the community center, um, and I'm I know we were waiting for you know some time to see what the impact had been. Um, can you, at least anecdotally, tell us you know what the usage has been since the fee reduction that took place? The, the great question. The usage has increased. Um, we I think we have 52 different groups and individuals who have been using um, the center compared to the same time last year. Um, that translates. I think it's about 1,800 hours of rentals. Um, and I remember when we had the the subcommittee and you made the comment you're going to make it up in volume we have um, so compared to the revenue last year compared to this year um, it's the same for the program rooms and auditorium um, and that continues to increase a um, couple of evenings a week usually Wednesdays and Thursdays and on the Saturdays is winter the, the community center has been at capacity um, <clears throat> we had an event there last night and we ran out of tables and chairs and we had one group in one room that had didn't need any tables and chairs um, so they're growing, still growing. Um, there's still capacity that Monday through Friday, 9 to 4. Um, there's still some capacity for, uh, for use. Um, there's a couple of things we have to improve on. Um, in the past, we didn't have to book and reserve time before and after for setup and cleanup just because we were open during COVID, but it wasn't, it wasn't used a lot. So we have to get back into doing that. So when somebody comes in and says, is it? Is a room open we've already scheduled a half hour or early, later or early to set up and take down and clean uh, before we can flip the room for the next group so we, we have to continue to improve that thank you thank you thank you Anna. Uh, this one is for mr gill um I've received communication lately that um there's certain groups that think um that they should be exempt from paying the fees to use different spaces and uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with that premise but my my basic question is this are there different rates for for-profit organizations that rent space versus nonprofits? Uh, great question. Before um, the subcommittee and fees, we did have the breakdown between for-profit resident, nonprofit resident, and the same for the non-resident. Um, that's all combined in, so it's one fee for residents and one fee for non-residents. Um, we don't we don't separate if you're a nonprofit or a profit at this moment. Follow up, Your Honor. Do you think there is an opportunity or uh, to separate for profit versus nonprofit? It seems like two different sort of missions. Um, I, I think long term the answer is going to be yes. I think right now we're still growing and we have that capacity. Um, you know, it's fifteen dollars an hour for a program room. That's you can't get that anywhere in this in this you know in the state. That goes back I think twenty years to our, our rates twenty years ago. Right. Um, but I do think is if the growth in the past six or seven months of use, um, maybe it's another year or so, we're probably going to have to, to look at that. We're already booking in, in, in through December, and we have a couple of small conferences, and they're booking everything, and it's, it's a great value for the money. A lot of nonprofits are doing it, um, but we're not quite there yet. Great. Thank you. Who else? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Are there any groups where you have waived fees or in the process of waiving fees? Um, there's, uh, I think you remember probably three or four years ago, um, working with Change for Concord, uh, Martin Toe, they, they came to RPAC, they came to the city council and they had um, got permission for four hours a month um, for free space. So they, they are continuing. Um, we do partner with like the VNA, um, they offer free health clinics for seniors that come in and do health checks 
Um, we partner with the Red Cross. Um, we do two or three blood drives at no charge. Again, that's the community you know, ask, ask, can't even speak community piece of it. Um, but there's no other group right now that gets free space per se, except for Change for Concord. And they came through and, and you guys granted it. So, but what does happen is I get requests, David gets requests for one-offs. Mm -hmm. So the way we've handled those with your approval is that then I'll take a look at what those requests are for a one-time use for something and waive those. So, and I'll, and I'll give David approval. And I don't think, have we turned really anybody down who's, you know, I've never heard any pushback um, for, but if it's clear, you know, if it's a, if it's a nonprofit doing something for the community, if it's a private group looking to save money by not going to a commercial establishment already, um, then that's, that's another, it's another can of worms there. So, because we I remember when we did the community <coughs> center, we had a lot of public meetings and one of the concerns was, are you going to cannibalize other businesses in the community? And the, and the, and the answer was no, the council did not want to, to, to do that. Um, however, we are, you know, looking at partners because we do have plenty of, we do have plenty of partners that we work with now. So I think there's, there are some opportunities to, to do some things there. And I plan to have something coming up, uh, working with uh, others to, at, at a future meeting. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you see the growth going, because everything sounds pretty positive, especially with the lowering of fees, do you see any issues with parking? Are we having any? parking issues yes uh, and the challenge is usually the, the evenings when we're full and then on the Saturdays um, you may remember when we we came up with the community center design <coughs> it included a, I think at the time it was a three-quarter of a million dollar parking lot it goes all the way down Canterbury Road we bought the house at the end of Canterbury for future development um, but at the time we made the decision let's see how growth is let's not build a big parking lot and all of a sudden we don't need it um, so there's three or four times a week now that we're at capacity for parking. Um, last night was one of them. Uh, people have been nice and respectful of parking on Cherry Street. Um, Cherry Street does allow parking, so folks have been good about not blocking driveways. That happened several times this winter too. Um, but I think probably, I mean, I think it's in the out years of the CIP as a placeholder. Um, you know, the new rates have only been in place for, you know, seven or eight months now, I, I think probably another year from now, we're probably going to get a real clear picture of um, what we have to do um, or if we have to do anything. Just a follow-up. I think you meant Chase Street, not Cherry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> like it just follow up on that. You'll recall that when you did the, the designs for the community center, when you did have the neighborhood meetings, the neighborhood said, this is great, we, we love this, but please be considerate regarding parking. If it gets to the point where parking is going to start overflowing on a regular basis and into the neighborhoods, we'd hope you do something about it, which is why you did the improvements and designs you did. But we didn't do the parking lot at that time because David said the demand wasn't there, that we weren't seeing the parking lot full. Now it's becoming full on a more regular basis. So you're going to need to do some major improvements, not only improving the existing parking lot, but add parking spaces out there. That's really sexy. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you so much. Have you considered um, maybe soliciting corporate sponsors to assist with nonprofits or entities who have a hardship that might want some sort of scholarship to be able to apply? Or I guess second question would be, um, have you considered and do you know of any interested parties who might want to establish a, you know, friends of Parks and Rec that m might serve that purpose as well? Just um, to ensure equity? Yeah, we haven't explored the, the sponsorship piece. I mean, we do a lot of um, <clears throat> fundraising on our own. We just, you know, we got the, you'll see it in June, but we just got sponsorship for the summer concert series. It was $8,000. So. I think there's probably opportunities to that. I think it's it, it, as the use grows and maybe some of the, all the, the nonprofits and the groups all come together and have that conversation. Um, I think I think there's probably value there. Um, I have not been approached by the friends of Parks and Rec. That's um, in state in the state is usually somebody other than staff that comes together. We have the friends of White's Park. They're here. You know they created themselves and they're there to help support us. Um, but every year we usually get about 100,000 to 150,000 in donations for various causes. 
um, but probably that could be something we can explore. And are those um, donations, are, there, are they airmarked for a particular purpose or are Correct. they general purposes and you determine where those nope. funds um, are? All, the do all donations, um, we come to you during a city council meeting and it's usually for certain projects. Um, like Ski the Beeve, everybody wanted to donate for the new cross country ski groomer. Life is good. Um, we just got a nice check yesterday for camps and they want to use it for summer camps. Um, so we have that and, and we have in finance, we have, I think there's probably 10 or 12 non-lapsing accounts that we earmark it for whatever they want to do. So, so we can do that. give you an example, the, the, for several years now, we've been receiving dollars from the Concord Housing and Redevelopment Authority so all children in Concord get free swim lessons. So that, that's something that's been a great resource. So they really are sponsorships. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up equity. Um, as we know, green space is so important for our health. And Ward 9, uh, all our wards were redistricted so that they're roughly the same population. However, uh, the budget says that Concord is 64 square miles. Ward 9 is one square mile and has 4,500 uh, 4, people in it. Within a half square mile is 85%, and that is right around Keach Park. When you're planning out your uh, leagues and camps, are you allotting time for the neighborhood to access that green space? There is no other green space between 393, Alton Woods, and um, the military base. Um, great question. Uh, if you look at Keach Park, it's about 11 acres. Five acres of that is athletic fields. And if you look at Rollins Park, it's 23 acres, and they have about 2.5 acres of athletic fields. So there's a lot of athletic green space for fields. They have three separate fields there. Merrill Park has two. Um, so working with the Recreation and Park Advisory Board, I think it was 2016, um, their recommendation is to, to keep at least two evenings a week and all day on Sundays, uh, no other leagues. Community use is for, is for the neighborhood. Uh, no other park has that, um, so we have we have continued doing that for the past since 2016 or 17. I'd like to suggest that we expand that because this is probably the densest uh, ward population-wise, and we're looking at a marginalized community that does not have access to transportation in the sense that other wards mm -hmm. do. Um, I would like to see. I know that there are. Um, of all the parks, there are six parks that have soccer fields. I would like to see more leagues and camps at other parks so that Keach Park is open and available uh, to the people who live around it that they can access it. Would you believe that's a question? Yes. Could, could I do that as an ad for hopefully you will approve the money for the um, Kiwanis Park because it's right there on the heights. Mm -hmm. I will answer those questions. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Mr. Gill, could you also speak to um, the relationships and the outreach you have with um, uh, diverse users of um, the rooms of the community center? I believe Overcomers uh, is, uh, is there and uh, the Family Center. And I think you've been working with Overcomers on employment. Yeah, I, I think um, probably I mean, Clement with Overcomers has been around for a long time, and he's a great resource. We've been working with him. We just recently hired a, uh, a new American. He helped with two days of um, language. He converted all of our rules and regulations for the, for the lady to understand the, um, the role of the job. Um, they were one group that came, um, started renting regularly with the lower rates. Um, the Family Center, Lori Hart's group, they're in there now two days a week. That's part of the Concord School District's Family Center, um, with the main goal is to outreach with the, with the new Americans. So they've expanded. Um, so there's always opportunities to, to do those connections when we can create them. And just follow up, I just, um, um, just Keach Park is um, in Ward 9 only because we needed a voting center, so there's maybe street and a half, but most of Keach Park is in Ward 8, and although Ward 9 has a lot of apartments, and especially Royal Gardens and um, Concord Gardens, about 300 units, uh, Ward 9 also has um, market rate apartments, also has condominium um, 
neighborhoods and it also has a lot of single family homes, especially in Ward 8 surrounding uh, Keach Park. So Keach Park is very, very diverse and although um, a lot of people when they think about Ward 9 and Keach Park, uh, I don't think they always think about the entire community and they were broader than what a lot of people think. And the number of parks and kind of on the same same conversation we've been working with the planning staff there's a lot of new housing developments planned on the heights um, some of them have access to sidewalks some of them do not um, there's a lot of development up in the 30 pines area we don't have a, a park in ward two um, so there there's a lot of multiple layers that i think when we look at the city we have to continue to reevaluate it as we grow um, so I, I think Kiwanis Riverfront Park will be an ad, Terrell Park will be an ad. Um, it helps a little bit, but it, there's still more to do. Okay. Any further questions? And, there, and I just want to explain, the reason I ask for questions is because we have a lot of people who want to testify, and we have the opportunity to speak whenever we want to speak. Um, we want to hear from the people who are showed up tonight and took their time. So who has questions that will raise the level of discussion? Councilor Brown. Yes, and it's because we have so many people here. Um, Mr. Gill, are there any vacancies on our pack right now? Uh, there is Ward 2 and Ward 9, and they've been vacant since, I think, January, and we have uh, candidates for both. I think they're at the city clerk's level, but I'm not 100% sure where the status of them are. Are there two vacancies for the school district as well? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, having gone through the library and the Parks and Recreation budget, we'll open the public hearing. Who would like to testify on either one of those budgets? Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Don Jewell. I live in the south end of Concord, and I am. Um, very pleased with the library uh, staff and the, and the situation that we have, uh, the services. Um, and I, I really think this reaching out that they, they do at, at different events that gather a lot of people is a really good idea because I know that it's amazing, but I do know that there are people who, mothers of children, fathers of children, that just don't realize that they can get uh, free library membership cards and the access to the library <coughs> and what services are available there. So reaching out to the people uh, to inform them, I think, is a really good thing. And I'm happy to hear that they're doing more of that. Um, access, uh, you know, appropriating money for books and different programs and services and so on and so forth, the needs of the library. But, is great, but I would just like to see, even at the main library, we talked about branches. Uh, the main library, I, I would at least like to see stay open um, on Thursday nights till eight o'clock um, as Monday through Friday. And I know after Memorial Day to um, Labor Day, they close at two on Saturdays. I'd like to see them stay um, open till five on Saturday. And closing Sundays is fine. People should have a day off. Um, and I uh, also want to speak to um, uh, the Parks and Rec. Um, I went to the event last night at um, the community center on Canterbury Road, and the parking lot was quite full, and it was good to see because that event was put on by the school district, but it it was all, pre the presenters were the National Alliance on Mental Illness and the Concord Parks and Rec Department. And, you know, people don't readily realize that the Concord Parks and Rec Department deals with a tremendous amount of youth in this community. And mental health issues uh, um, for children, you know, from elementary school right up to high school, are involved in these programs, and these issues affect staff, they affect the volunteers of the program, and so to have the Parks and Rec Department paying attention to this, weighing in on it, and being a part of this conversation, which was well attended last night, 
was really a, a blessing to see that. And um, so what David's doing with his staff and program, it's, 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 really, uh, it's really good to see. So, great. Any questions, Mr. Drew? Good to see you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again, everybody. First, I'm going to answer a question from Councillor Bouchard about the parking. I, it varies, and one of the issues I've seen is a lot of the senior events start at 11 o'clock, and so that means that if there's, say, the fire, fire department training that started at 8, all the spaces are full when the seniors arrive, and a lot of them use walkers and canes, and so you know, they're having to walk from the auxiliary parking lot or maybe you know, find a place in the neighborhood. And I think that's discouraging attendance at senior events and you know, not having a parking space close to the door. And you know, the thing is, you know, sure, if you have a handicap tag, you can use it, but there's got to be a vacant space to use it. So if all those spaces are you know, taken up, that's an issue. And uh, Mr. Gill said, well, maybe he can try and encourage some of the more able-bodied people to park further away. But you know, we'll just have to see how that goes. But, but you know, if you're going to expand the parking lot and you're having more spaces, all the way down the other end of Canterbury Road isn't going to solve that particular problem. Anyway, to get back to the library, I happen to disagree with Mr. Jewell. I think that the Sunday hours for the library are very important. Both the Portsmouth Library and the Nashua Library have Sunday hours. And I've heard various stories about this. One is that uh, we can't get staff to work those days. And at one time, there were certain positions before the pandemic that that was why you were hired to work on Sundays. So of course you've got people who'd work those days if that was in the job description. But since they haven't been open on Sundays for a while, you know, those people have left and, you know, they're not around anymore. And I, you know, Mr. Jewell is a Christian, so Sunday is a very important day to him. But I'd like to say we have a diverse community here. There might be people who are Jewish who would rather not work Saturday. There might be people who are Muslim who might not want to work Friday. And Perhaps we could solve the problem of uh, people working Sunday just by trying to attract more diverse staff. And the other thing is that you have an issue, I think, with both of these satellite libraries. I mean, the Pentecost one, when the new library opens, they're going to have to discard most of their books because the new version of the Pentecost library will have hardly any books. They'll just be on carts like they are at the Heights. And I think people, some people are seeing that as an issue. I think that with a better design, right now the library has one room they can lock up and one big room, and they wheel the books out to the big room, and then they wheel them back in, so that room can be used for other things. I would say, let's do it the other way around. Let's have the lockable room have floor-to-ceiling shelves, really fill it up with books, and then just have to put a few administrative things, wheel them into that room, but have you know the other stuff out but not the huge stack of books. So that's, you know, what I'd like to see. And the other thing I've heard is, oh, it takes, you know, a godly number of people to operate a lot, the main library, and it would be very expensive to open it on Sundays. Well, they used to be able to afford to do it. But I'm going to make a different suggestion. What if we opened the Heights Library on Sunday? I'm told that building is open 12 to 4 on Sunday for most of the year. Let's say that library was open on Sunday. So if somebody wanted to call a reference librarian, you could redirect the reference queries from the main library to the Heights Library on Sundays. If people you know, wanted to go do something in a library, there would be a library that was open. And that would be far less expensive because you're running that with two people as compared to, I think it's seven or eight they think it takes to operate the main library. And the last question I'll speak to was the volunteers. I'm actually a library volunteer. I haven't done anything in years. We used to have a lot of activities during a previous administration. Like I put all the uh, sod out on the lawn and stuff. I used to show movies, but people didn't like to be alone in the dark with me, and they discovered the librarian could just turn it on and leave. And we used to have gatherings where we'd go and all the children's books you know, they're plastic pages. We take, you know, sponges and wipe off the children's books on the plastic pages and we used to read them to each other while we're doing this. It was kind of fun. We used to have a machine 
that you could buff the uh, CDs. So if a CD got kind of used, we could, you know, kind of clean it up so it was more operable. But since the pandemic, none of these activities have come back. I don't know if they're paying librarians to do them or they're just not getting done. But I think you could attract people to do that. And one of the advantages of them is it's not a time you've got a book every week all the time at just certain days. So if you're available that day, you come in and meet up with folks and do it. And one last thing that we really need to put a, in the budget and deal with is right now to work for the library. It would help if you had a degree called a master's in laboratory science because I think those people spend more time opening the bathrooms than they do giving book suggestions. I don't think it's a good s system whereby anyone that wants to use a restroom has to get someone who may have a master's degree to take the key and go open the restroom for them. We need to devise a system whereby the people can open the restrooms for themselves. And I don't know whether that's you know, putting a giant thing on the key so the key doesn't get lost, whether it's having you know, a push button at the desk so you can click the thing open, or whether it's even going back to the system everywhere else where people want to use the restroom just go in. So you need to cure that because I think that may be something that's affecting staff turnover. I mean, is that really what you want to spend your time doing if you're a professional librarian? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Mrs. Sawyer? Seeing none, appreciate it. My name is Bodhi Vaderai. I just turned nine years old. I am in third grade and I use a wheelchair. I like the new playground design because it looks cool and I can play on it. I love ice skating at White Park, but I don't really go there in the summer because I can't play on the playground. My little sister goes there all the time and sometimes my friends have birthdays there. But I can't play with my friends because there's wood chips and wood chips are not accessible. I have lots of friends and I love to play. I want playgrounds to be accessible because then it would be really cool to play whenever I want and with anyone I want, maybe even my sister, but probably not. <laughs> unless, if, unless if there's ice, I can't play at White Park. That makes me feel bad. Thank you for building a new playground because, because playgrounds are places where everyone, everybody should be able to play. Thank you. Good evening. For the record, my name is Deo Dene Dustin Baderai. My husband and I live in East Concord and we're raising our two kids there. I wanted to take a moment to thank you for supporting initiatives that increase the ability of people with disabilities to access community spaces, including the inclusive playground at White's Park. One in four people has a disability. There are no playgrounds in the Concord area that are inclusive or even not even at the schools. ADA compliant, maybe. Um, but actually inclusive or even accessible, not even close. For example, concrete area playgrounds are surfaced with wood chips, and for those who use wheelchairs, walkers, strollers, to those who simply have poor balance, uh, chip surfacing is a barrier and to entering and navigating a playground. I'm excited that the city manager included the proposed redesign of the Monkey Around Playground in his budget. I appreciate the opportunity to have worked with many of you over the last five years. Um, to work on this project, and I hope that you will keep this project on track and prioritized. Um, as I was listening to the discussion on parking at the Heights Community Center, again, we're in East Concord, we use it a lot. Uh, we often can't park in the handicap parking spots, and in and of itself is fine. Um, we don't have a big van, so we are able to navigate um, in the regular spots, but the problem we run into is that there's a lack of curb cuts in the entrance way to the uh, community center. From my, under from my experience, I can only find one, and it's where it goes from the handicapped parking across a parking lot, across a road, 
where traffic goes through and then that's the small curb cut onto the um, sidewalk which you have to go a little bit and then into the building whereas if you're if you park on either end of the handicap parking you don't have a curb cut so we have to travel in the road where a lot of traffic is because it's a busy time to find the one curb cut so I would recommend just uh, trying to uh, add in some curb cuts at the front of the building. That would be helpful. Any questions? So, it's Vody, right? Yes. I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Jeez. Vody, did you say you were nine years old? Yeah. So, Vody, I don't really have a question for you, but I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> so, you gave, and I hope the manager paid attention, the best testimony the most concise and the most effective testimony that we've heard in a very, very long time. So I want to thank you for coming tonight, and I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. You also got to be nice to your sister. <laughs> well, so like to that could be a bridge too far. Either one. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name's Jennifer Goodman. I'm a Concord resident and um, former board member of the nonprofit Friends of Concord Crew. And I think all of you know the boathouse and the basis of that nonprofit is in um, Kiwanis Riverfront Park. Uh, Chris Graham, who's also a Concord resident, chair of the current board um, of the Friends of Concord Crew, couldn't be here tonight. She asked me to come and share a message. They're super busy doing their last big regatta in Hanover. They're sending nine kids to nationals in Florida, which is really cool, um, and hosting the Concord version of the National Learn to Row uh, program where anybody can get in a boat um, next weekend. So she just wanted me to share with you that the, the board really appreciates the city's early stages of planning enhancements at that park, Kiwanis Riverfront Ooh. Park, and better, safer connections for people with access to the river, downtown, the heights, parks to the north and south. Um, so the program really urges your support in the budget of the next stage of the plan's development and really is committed, the, the board members, the parents of the youth rowers, the new masters rowers, uh, want to stay engaged throughout the process. So just wanted to share that support for that part of the budget. Um, I, Jennifer, certainly echo those statements. Um, and really think that those park enhancements, those river corridor enhancements can be uh, great for visitors, great for businesses, but most importantly, great for people on both sides of the river. So great. thank you. Thank you. That was that? Yeah, that was great, thank you. <laughs> so um, I, you might have seen, I talked to our assistant city manager um, over here on the side, and uh, with the council's indulgence, I think um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is not only testify on the parks and recreation budget, the library budget, but I'd also like to include the CIP budget to come out and testify now if you wish. And that way, because you all can go home and enjoy your evening, and then we can stay afterwards and get the presentation on the rest on the CIP. If that acceptable, everybody? That sounds great. All right. Yes, sir. So, anybody want to testify either library, you're next. Uh, library, parks and rec, or anything in the uh, capital improvement. Uh, <coughs> Much as well. Welcome. Hello, um, Mayor, City Council. My name is uh, Mike Pelletier. I'm a teacher in Concord. I've taught here for about 18 years now and uh, f almost lifelong Concord resident. I escaped for three or four years and, and came right back. Um, I couldn't be more proud to live in Concord. I have two daughters, uh, one in middle school, one in high school, and um, they're athletic kids. They play a lot of sports. and I coached a lot of sports and I've um, just been here for a while. So I'm um, here to speak on just the general quality of the athletic fields in Concord. Um, I think I had blinders on uh, when I was, when my kids were little um, <coughs> because we were just staying in Concord and you know they did the little soccer with you know Parks and Rec and we were just staying in Concord and then when they started to travel a little bit which was probably I don't know fifth, fourth, fifth grade, um, you started to see the fields in Hampstead the fields in Bedford, um, the fields at Nashua, and you started to see a lot of turf, 
and you started to see, maybe not always turf, but like Hampstead, Hampstead has these depot road fields that are like the most beautiful fields going, and you'd never even guess they were there. And it just pops up city after city after city, and the more we look at our fields in Concord, they're subpar at best. Um, and we rely heavily on the runlet fields, which are overused and honestly a little unsafe at times because they're hard as a rock because they, they're used so much, but we don't have anything else. Um, the RMS lacrosse field and field hockey field is small, too small, so it actually runs uphill on the back left corner. So you've got girls playing lacrosse uphill. Um, and other school districts are coming to see this, right, to see what we have in Concord. And it's at Memorial Field as well with the ponds that are created at the lacrosse field and the softball field. And I believe um, the baseball field is pretty much underwater this year already. So um, I am so proud to live in Concord, but I am extremely embarrassed about our athletic fields here. A um, couple of the kind of three things I wanted to touch upon. I know there's talk about turf in Concord. This seems to be talk about turf in Concord for the last 15 years or so. Um, we don't need one turf field. We need multiple turf fields. Um, if you go to Bedford, they've used this space, which is like along power lines. It's like the ugliest space imaginable. And they put three beautiful turf fields right there. No stadiums, no nothing. There's a set of bathrooms and three turf fields. Um, and it's so incredibly useful. There's people there, athletes there all the time. Um, and I'm sure they're making a lot of money off those fields with different organizations coming in. Um, so I would ask for not one turf field. I know we need a stadium. I would love a stadium with turf. Um, but you don't need all stadiums. You need fields. You've got to put fields down so people can use them. Um, my second ask would be, what was my second ask? Sorry. Oh, my second ask with the Terrell Park. So my understanding is that maybe there's not enough money to do the Terrell Park turf. Fine. Put a field there. Put a field there. Um, it'll give p organizations, my, another job of mine is running Concord Crush Youth Lacrosse, so it'll give organizations like us, like Concord Capitals Football, um, a space to go um, and to pay for it if we need to. Um, my, last, my last request is that, uh, are there lights being put at Keach Park? Am I correct on that? Okay, which is awesome. That's great. Um, you know, give organizations who are willing to pay for it access to those. Um, that would extend Springs Tough. Right, Springs tough for a lot of reasons. Number one, we don't have turf, so you can't get you can't get access to fields until the snow melts, which is natural. Um, where Bedford is on fields from from early March on, okay, and sometimes earlier. Honestly, um, we are at a huge disadvantage athletically in Concord because our fields are so subpar. So I'll close with: I couldn't be more proud to live here, but we need better athletic fields. Um, it's it's embarrassing to be a coach in Concord at times and have other communities come see what we're playing on and have a lot of comments on it. So, thank you. Thank you for your time. Gene, anybody? Thank you for taking time tonight. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Who'd like to go next? Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Chris Harrington. I'm with uh, the Concord Skate Park Association. Um, we're here with Parks and Rec in favor of CIP 60 and supporting for a new skate park and the new renovation concept. That's what we've been working on the last couple months. Uh, we have lot large support from uh, local community businesses and lots of people also showing up in support to our events. We've got a few events going on this year to kind of keep the steam rolling and uh, just excited with uh, VHB and their concept that they showed off a couple months back. Great. Anybody any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate all the effort you're making. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you, guys. Who'd like to go next? Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Rick McPartland. I'm here uh, as a resident of deep left field of the baseball park at White Field, uh, the father of an 18-year-old who grew up in that park and particularly on the Monkey Around Playground. And uh, in my official capacity as the treasurer of the Friends of White Park, 
Um, just wanted to speak in uh, in favor of the uh, budget item to uh, to reconstruct uh, the monkey round playground. Um, just want to sort of reiterate that uh, we've been working with the Parks and Rec Department for a significant period of time, many years. Want to thank them for all their help with that. Um, that the plan that's before that we're looking at is something that comes out of uh, a lot of community meetings, particularly with children uh, who would be using uh, the park. Um, and that was sort of a, a plan that arose out of the input that we got from the community. Um, playground is past its life expectancy uh, significantly, and, and, and there's sort of fewer and fewer things for kids to do uh, when they're there. Um, and that the plan is, uh, as Bodhi put more elegantly than I will, uh, the first uh, all accessible playground that we would have in Concord. Um, we feel very strongly that uh, this community needs to have a playground where all the kids of the community and all of the parents and grandparents of the community can go and play, see their kids play, um, and uh, so that that park can continue to serve uh, a diverse and uh, broad array of the folks that live in this city. Thank you. Anyone? Appreciate you taking the time to come out. Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Want to introduce everybody while we're okay? Okay, all right. Sorry, I spaced out a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we do too. So. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Martin Stephen Sfisto. We're all member of Change for Concord, uh, honorable mayor, and members of the council. Super happy to be here. And uh, I, I guess we have a few things that we wanted to share, and uh, we'll start off. Um, on the left, and then we'll go this way. Howdy, folks, uh, mayor and uh, committee members. My name is Stephen Kidder, pronouns he, him, lifelong Concord resident. Went to every single, um, I went, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, and like Mr. Pelletier, also was only briefly away for a few years, um, going away to college. Um, and I just want to say how um, important it is and how Grateful we are um, that these uh, lights are finally going up at Keach Park. Um, it's been a long, hard fi uh, fight, um, and we're excited um, for this next step. Yeah, um, Honorable Mayor in the City Council, uh, my name is Fiston Dashimie, and I'm a lead organizer for Change for Concord. It's a pleasure to be here to tonight. Um, first, we would like to recognize the work you have put into uh, this project to make sure it is included in the budget uh, for this um, for fiscal year 2024. We thank the leader of the city council, uh, the city councilors in general, and the city manager for making this possible. So with that being said, I would, uh, I'm would gonna ask uh, Stephen to go ahead and read our testimony for t tonight. Of the soccer field, um, is heavily utilized by people from different cultures and backgrounds, especially during evening hours. However, the absence of lighting has made it difficult and unsafe for players and spectators alike. We believe that installing lights at, at the soccer field would not only improve safety, but also enhance the overall experience for everyone. Firstly, lights would allow for longer and safer playing hours. Many individuals and teams have limited, have limited availability due to work or school schedules, and the only time they can play soccer is in the evenings. With proper lighting, um, they can safely continue to play and enjoy the park even after the sun goes down. Additionally, 
lighting would provide a safer environment for players and, and spectators, especially women and children who may feel uncomfortable walking through the dark, um, walking through the park after dark. Secondly, um, installing lights at uh, the soccer field would be a great step towards promoting inclusivity, equity, and diversity. Our park is known for its diverse community and providing adequate lighting would ensure that everyone can enjoy and feel welcomed in the park regardless of their background. A well at soccer field would encourage participation from people of all ages, genders, and cultural backgrounds, bringing together the community in a safe and friendly environment. Finally, like the soccer field would also benefit the local economy. With a well-lit and safe environment, the park would become more attractive to people who would be more likely to spend time and money in the area. This would help promote local businesses and encourage more people to use the park for recreational purposes. This would help to promote local businesses and encourage more people to use the park for rec recreational purposes. Since Keach Park is a neighborhood park, we ask the city to prioritize the neighborhood community's access to the field. In conclusion, Change for Concord views um, also, uh, also represent those of all our community members impacted by the absence of lighting at Keach Park. We also recognize partners, students, young people within our community, and the community members who spoke at the community forum supporting the campaign um, a few, uh, about a month ago. We strongly advocate for the prompt installation of lighting fixtures at the soccer field in Keach Park, which serves a diverse community. I urge you, the city council, to prioritize this matter without any further delay. It would not only enhance safety and promote inclusivity, but also benefit the local economy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. So before um, questions, I would like to specifically uh, appreciate um, City Councilor Ward 9. I think you've done a lot of work uh, around Keach Park. Uh, a few days ago, I was um, walking around looking you know, for some things uh, that I think we're going to work on. I think you've done uh, such an amazing job to make Keach Park beautiful. And I understand there's more work to do. Um, including lights, of course. And I would like to uh, appreciate the city council. Yeah, I think you've supported her and other uh, Ward 8, Ward 7 city councilors. You've done a great job. And the mayor, thank you so much. Um, and also, I would like to appreciate community members who has been supporting me a lot, specifically uh, uh, Dana, Dana Ford. She's, uh, uh, she's a teacher, also does a great job in our school school district. I think she's done a lot of work and, and put it put it effort to make sure everything is is working well. And Catherine from Sierra Club, <coughs> thank you so much. Th those are my um, um, community members. So um, I, I think th they've done a lot of work. I think. Uh, it's, it, it, is, it is my priority to appreciate them, uh, appreciate them publicly. And um, I think there was also an organization that supported Change for Concrete to make this happen. Uh, we, are, we are going in the right direction and recognizing young people and, and uh, diversity, what we have in our community. I think it's, it's our priority as leaders and the community members. I appreciate you all. So, I don't know if Martin has anything to say, and you're gonna. I ask don't have questions. anything else to say, but when I came here, I had long hair, and you can see I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I came here, I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Anybody you. Any questions, Councilor uh, yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, you heard Mr. Pelletier. Uh, comment about Keach Park and his excitement about the lights up at Keach Park and the potential for the city to seek revenue for those that wanted to rent the fields at Keach Park and especially the lighted fields. Can you comment on that, please? Your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah. yeah. So the the wonderful thing and the I guess I'll say economic benefits of um, providing lights at Keach Park is uh, uh, that one is night use. Uh, which is one of the things that Mr. Politeer talked about was um, there is an, uh, spaces where um, sporting events can happen during the nighttime. And um, it also attracts teams in, um, in events in Concord, especially in a place where we did talk about diversity and we mm. talk about a place that's vibrant, that brings the city at life. Um, uh, this would also bring revenue to the city and local businesses um, as people do uh, get hungry 
and mm -hmm. you know we'll be spending money um, and also creates jobs for those who live on the Heights as well. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question. Um, Mr. Toe, I know that you're one of the founders of Change for Concord mm -hmm. and you currently live in Manchester correctly, correct? But you're, I, I want to make, close. <laughs> very close, but I want to make sure that you understand that we um, certainly uh, understand the need for stakeholders that are all over the state because we are the state capital. But I think for the taxpayers of Concord, it's important to know that you are here to speak um, on behalf of Change for Concord, though not a resident of the city of Concord, correct? Yeah, that's really nice to say. I actually live in Hooksit, but very true. <laughs> yeah, I'm a member of. Come on, here's a better answer than that. You try to get. All right, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I was oh. thinking you should say, yeah, but I want to live in Concord. Right. Yeah, you, you know what? I, I'm coming back to Concord. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I want to point out there are stakeholders from all over the mm -hmm. city, and everybody has a different um, participation. So I appreciate that the minutes are going to reflect you're from Hooksit, but that your heart and soul is in Concord. That's right. right. Thank you. I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Anyone hey, else? Chancellor. That's Brown. Yes. Um, Mr. Toe, didn't you did you perform a unity concert recently for uh, the residents of Concord? That was that was free a free event. Yeah, uh, apart from causing good trouble, I'm also a musician. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, we did do a free concert for the city, and um, as a way of bringing folks out to enjoy the diversity, the good tunes, and every good thing that you could uh, possibly imagine within. Um, a, a good gathering, yeah. I think um, I remember from your 2018 testimony talking about how lights, how soccer brings people out from different <laughs> cultures and communities um, to bond together, and it looks like you're still doing that work for us in Concord. I want to say that I appreciate you very much. Thank you, and I also want to thank Fisto, Stephen, um, everybody else that's here tonight that are continuing the fight um, for bring, making this community a more beautiful place. So thank you. I wrote down. Thank you. Did um, I understand that you um, you would like this field to just be soccer only and other users not using it for other sports or or because Fisto and I've had a conversation and um, my one concern about the lights is they'll right now change for Concord and neighborhood are only, the only ones using the fields on the public nights. But once it's lit, we might see other pickup games coming to play in different sports. Yeah. And so, I'm, just, you know, flag football, lacrosse, um, pickup games. So my concern has been that uh, the neighborhood might actually lose time playing, especially if the fields get overused because they'll be closed because we'll have to let them rest and they'll be closed but i just i just want to be clear on the ask and uh, currently the city policy is that um, users pay for lights and do you support that or do you want me to tackle that uh, i'll go and then go on oh yeah i'm gonna add. all right um <laughs> councillor candace thank you so much um so uh, one of the things is that you know I don't, I lived in Concord for a long time, um, but I never got a chance to um, watch black uh, ice hockey. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the things I think uh, that would also be played at Keach Park, uh, which will also help the community um, get more involved in other sporting events that maybe that side of the um, town is might not be able to see. I've heard um, since since the last time I came here and I had a ponytail um, that there um, is a lot of teams that sign up for black ice hockey but never get the opportunity to play uh, because uh, of the of the limited space at at, at, White, at White Park and so having lights would also make it accessible for those other teams to be able to play um, which I definitely am gonna go be there to to watch a black um, ice hockey game. Um, and then the other thing too is, um, uh, you know, I think, I, yeah, it, it, it uh, uh, you know, other sports and other teams are going to be using the field and uh, that's something we all celebrate together. Good, good. Yeah. And I want to, um, 
I always tell people when we speak, um, Change for Concord comes up, the work you put in to do the coffee house cafes, and fortunately COVID hit, and yeah. it did two with two different age groups, and um, I hope somehow that, that that can come back, especially the first one with the teenagers, and we had the, you, you got the parents of the, of the teens to be the chaperones, and I thought that was just such a great community event. For yeah. <coughs> Higher age groups of the new Americans together. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I would like to add on that. So, I mean, we keep talking about soccer, soccer, and that was a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's not just a, about soccer, it's more like culture. Those are conversations that we have as young people from different backgrounds because soccer is a priority to our young people. It's more like culture. And, and we have We've had a conversation with the city council many times. We talk about uh, our community has become more diverse, and that's a point, right? But we haven't started celebrating those differences, culture differences, right? And having lights at the Kitch Park, you know, it creates more hours for young people who work longer hours and have opportunity to use the park but also making sure that the field is safe for young people to play soccer since we have, you know, the height has, uh, it's very, very diverse with a lot of young people from different countries and they love soccer. So we have to recognize that. But that, that doesn't take away our opportunities um, uh, for other people to use the field. That actually creates, access, you know, more access for other, um, I mean, uh, other groups to use the field and we would like to learn from those people, and that's what creates our community. Um, I mean, that's what makes our community more diverse, is learning, learning from other, other groups and working together, playing together to make our, our community more inclusive. So, I'll, uh, yeah. so you, you understand you might have to share the field with, a, with different groups playing a different sport. I mean, Kitch Park is, is big. Mm -hmm. but I, three, think, I think there's three fields? Yeah, the Kitch right, Park is big. Sharing is caring. Right. Uh, I, I think that's a point. That's 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 a conversation we're gonna have many times. I think we're getting lost for the Kitchen Park, right? Kitchen Park, and Kitchen Park is big. So, and we don't want to take advantage on other groups. So we want we want to make sure we divide the field, where some people are playing soccer. If other people want to use a field for other different uh, activities, they can use the park. That's how we want to make Kitchen Park look like. And that, that, is, that is what we're advocating for. It's not just about one, one side of the field. Um, sharing is caring, yes. So everybody's going to be using the field. I just, just want to make sure yeah. you know, uh, yeah. understandings. Yeah. Thank you. Well, understands. So please don't. I want to make sure I understand this correctly. If I come up and I want to kick a ball around with you, I'm, it's OK. It's cool. <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> okay, like, I will, show, I will show you if you don't know how to. Will you run after it when I miss, you know, like when I can't get it to you? Uh, oh, God. Nobody wants to see that, don't <laughs> they? <laughs> um, can I follow up on uh, uh, Councillor Bruchard? I think sharing the field is one thing, but I think what Feast and Martin were getting on is it also brings people from other parts of Concord to, ke to keep <clears throat> park. And I think that's wonderful because it, it, does, it does meld so many different cultures together. So. The beauty of Concord is watching a variety of people from a variety of different backgrounds play soccer in Keach Park. And I think that's a wonderful, I think that speaks to, that speaks to one of the beauties of Concord. I think that would, um, so lights up in Keach Park would only enhance that in my opinion. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Before John. Before we, we, we move, I, I apologize for that. I would like you to meet my supporters and my, uh, my members of the, the Change for Concord. Would you all stand up, please? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Who else like to testify? <coughs> Welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, my name is Ravani. I live in Conquer. I live in Chima Street, so I live like right next to West Park. Um, I know West Park have a light and Kish Park doesn't have a light. 
And for me, going to Kishpa is like where I see all my friends from. Like we all come together, we bond. It's not all about soccer, it's all about like coming together as ones because they, uh, Kishpa is the way you see everybody from different diverse and we all get to go play different sports like basketball and soccer or other sports. It's like there's not one time I ever feel like <clears throat> because I don't live at Kishpa, it's like I, anytime I want to play soccer, I just go to Kishpa and everybody's welcoming and everyone is so nice to each other. So I feel like when you're, um, the mayor, um, she asked about if the field is open to everyone. I feel like Kishpa is open to everyone. Everyone's welcome to come. I play with different people from different backgrounds. And people come from Manchester, they can play at Kishpa. So Kishpa is a very good place. So we'll like, we'll make up play soccer for a long time, new stay fight for a long time. So I really want to say thanks to all of you guys for the great work you guys are doing for Conquer. Conquer is the best place to live for me. I feel like I came from a different country five years ago. I've been in Conquer and everybody's so nice. And I really appreciate Life in Conquer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gabby. Gabby, it's all you. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to see you all. My name is Catherine Corkery. I am uh, a resident of Concord and I uh, work for New Hampshire Sierra Club and our office is also in Concord. Um, I wanted to first off um, make sure uh, that the council and the city is aware of a really fun event called Green Your Fleet event and expo and not only is it about electric vehicles it's also an opportunity to ride and maybe drive an electric vehicle around the new hampshire speedway so um i really hope that you take advantage of it um uh, because i think it's a really great opportunity to see the um the breadth of vehicles available to the city. Um, and it's not just electric vehicles. There are some other fossil fueled vehicles, um, but it's a, it's a wide variety. And um, the, it is put on by DES. And the last time I looked, there isn't anyone from Concord. And it would be great to have um, the facilities people go to it. Um, they may have gone to it in the past, I do not know. But uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't invite everyone. Um, but uh, I wanted to just say my accolades to the, the, uh, the city manager and to the mayor and to the council for such a strong budget supporting the parks. Um, throughout the city, there is a really significant investment into the open spaces in the city. Uh, and that's huge. These investments are not just for us here today, but for our children and for future generations to really um, reap the benefits of the being outdoors, uh, the health and mental health benefits um, for that. Uh, the access to the river is so important, all the way to um, the athletic fields in Keech Park. And I wanted to um, outline the work that we did with um, Change for Concord. Uh, I, I met uh, Fisto, uh, he introduced me to the Change, of Con Change for Concord. And um, in about a, after about a month or so of talking, we realized that there was an overlap with the parks and, and how Sierra Club, we like parks, <laughs> and Change for Concord had a focus on Keach Park. And we are organizers, so we helped them uh, create a plan to raise public awareness and um, and uh, what we assisted them in an online petition 
uh, and canvassing, and also the uh, public forum. And honestly, they did all the work. Uh, it was a real pleasure to work with them. Um, and as you saw in the handout, there were, after a week, we only collected petitions for a week. Uh, we, see, we re received 126 signatures from Concord and 35 from out of town. Uh, and, and you'll see that in the handout there uh, that Fisto uh, shared. And th this is really a strong proposal, as I said, uh, not just for Keach Park, but for the city and, and for everyone who lives here. And um, we support it uh, wholeheartedly and ask for your support as well. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Cockery, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I have a question about the Sierra Club and your light policy at night. You have a policy that is about not having glowing skies for migratory birds. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. But it's a glowing hazard related to bird migration, and we have no concerns about that in this, this particular location. In, in this application, the lights are pointed down towards the field, and they are, the expectation is that they're tar turned off after 10. Is, I, I will follow up on those questions with the city manager. Thank you so much. I appreciate sure. it. Anyone else? Report Thank down. you, Ms. Mayor. Uh, good to see you. Uh, so Sierra Club is supporting lights just on one sports field, not lighting the entire park or other fields, just one sports field. Is that the? I, is that's that, my understanding. Well, you're the Sierra Club, so. Well, yeah. th that, my yeah. understanding is that the field, pr lights proposal are, is for I'm just field the soccer field on Keach Park, is is that what the proposal is? It is, but there's like other moving parts that have been, I'm just asking. I'm, so okay. you, you support lights on one field, but you would have concerns if we lit the entire park? Um, I, club. Don't I, okay. I, I don't know one the field answer is good. to that. One field is good. <laughs> but I guess I understood the proposal to be on the soccer field okay, in great. Keach Park. I, I wish we had been able to talk one-on-one, um, -on -one, but that's, that is my expectation. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any? Anyone else? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Who else would like to ask by? Way in the back. Could you leave the flyer yes, yes. with uh, Mr. Wolf? Hello, Council. My name is Carter Sagan. I'm speaking regarding the Kiwanis Park uh, going over by this Everett Arena. So I am not a Concord resident. I am a Loudoun resident, the abutting town, and I come to support the skate park because of the lack in the whole project, because of the lack of recreational action sports areas to ride skateboards, biking, scooters, rollerblades, whatever it may be. I find that there's a lack of drive of, of that action sport area in the state of New Hampshire because of the lack of parks. And it's incredible to me that the city of Concord, the capital of New Hampshire, doesn't have a, I don't want to say state-of-the-art skate park, but a skate park that's rideable for everybody and a skate park that's available for all age groups, whether you're beginner, novice, or the intermediate, or even the advanced. What we have right now is looking to be upgraded, and it excites me, and I just, I'm here to show my appreciation that the budget may allow the skate park to be updated along with the whole park. The big drive I find is that a lot of my friends from Concord, but the big part is the community that, for me, I'm personally I'm a bike rider, and I ride the BMX bikes, not the mountain bikes, and we're looking for a park to ride. So I know I have people up in Campton, and there's people down in the Nashua area always looking for somewhere to ride. And Concord, New Hampshire being the central hub would be a great place to ride. I also know people from out of state coming to the area to ride. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Rye Airfield was the indoor premium skate park of New Hampshire. It was the largest skate park in New England. 
was shut down three years ago because of COVID. And because of that, the scene has fizzled out, but there's still a drive for people to find a place to ride. And regarding the size of the ramps, the skill level, what it may be, there's not that scene here now. So me seeing that there is a proposal to increase the Concord Skate Park, the central hub of New Hampshire, really excites me because of, as the abutting towns, I know it'll bring more community, more business, more groups, more events to the Concord area, especially with the plans going on the Everett Arena area. So I just want to say thank you for considering the proposal for the, adding it to the budget and appreciate your time listening to me. Thank you. Any questions? That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, no so worries. if you don't know the answers to these questions, it's perfectly okay. Yep. How many parks does Loudoun have? Loudoun has one skate park. Oh, 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 parks. No, parks. Uh, so Loudoun has, let me see, two. <laughs> How many are handicap accessible? Uh, Ma'am, I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> I, 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 on, as, as I said, you may um, not know so the So it has, there's a, so the Loudoun Elementary School, behind the park yes. has wood chips and I remember being a child there, I'm 24 now, the people with handicapped disabilities were able to go in the park but had wood chips to prevent it. Um, the park over near the fire station, the rec field, um, does not have wood chips, has soccer fields, they're not regulation size and there's no lights because they're not regulation size and I don't know if the abutters would agree about lights but they're there, and I don't believe there's any handicap restrictions, but I, I'm not an expert on the field. My apologies. No worries, and you know you're always welcome to move to Concord. <laughs> I'm, I'm over on Old Shaker Road after so Shaker close. Road. So, so I get the benefit of being very close to Concord, but I like living in a Class 6 road in the woods. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you come here from Loudoun, or I'm thinking you probably would come more if there was... So I come here from Loudoun, and I know a great deal of people that are, my, my, I do uh, biking, and I used to do professional biking, so I do contests, and I perform at school shows. Okay. There isn't a, uh, that would be down in Massachusetts, though, because okay. the scene wasn't up there, because there wasn't parks up here for people to learn on, and that's why I'm excited for the development of this Concord Park. So I have a question. When you come in and s skate or bike, yep. what, what other businesses would you spend your dollars on if you come here for the day? Where would you? Oh, well, food is an important one. Food and finding <laughs> hydration is the biggest thing. Um, in the area, I mean, me personally, and I know my friends as well, uh, disc golf is one of the other hobbies we go to. And then I have friends from Massachusetts that come up and ride. They, well, they used to ride. We don't have a park anymore, or we don't have the Ryer Field Park anymore. Um, rock climbing. Mm -hmm. It was another action sport they would do. So it would do one action sport at the Concord Skate Park and then move their business to, uh, uh, it's not Evil Rock and Fitness anymore. I think it's just New Hampshire Climbing and Fitness. Just another action sport because that genre of people that enjoy doing action sport activities and learning tend to, kind of spin in that area. So S&W, the bike and board shop in, New, in Concord. Um, I'm trying to think of any other areas. Okay. So I know I spend a deal of my time in Concord because it is the capital. There's a lot to do here. So people coming out of state to come ride a, to come ride a skate park and see the park itself will end up spending time here as well. Not even out of state, but just in areas around New Hampshire because the amount of skate parks in New Hampshire are limited. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me speak. <coughs> Hi there. Good evening. Uh, my name's Ted Rice. I'm a five-year. I, I moved to Concord five years ago from the West Coast. Uh, I'm a lifelong skateboarder. I'm a dad. Uh, I, I work locally. Uh, <coughs> I met the group for the Concord Skate Park Association. We, we decided that there was a great need for a skate park here, a modern skate park that's safe and accessible to all. Um, <coughs> where I come from, there's skate parks everywhere. I've met probably <coughs> some of the most fantastic people in my life due to skateboarding. Uh, <coughs> brings together cultures and, you know, community. 
the, the kids and the people who regular uh, are, are the regulars at the <coughs> skate park. They, they've built their lives around this skate park. Um, they have lifelong friends. Uh, <coughs> they care about it. They clean it. They maintain it. Um, the problem is it's not up to date. Uh, skateboarding is one of the most popular <coughs> growing sports in the world. Um, and Concord, as a state capital, is one of, I believe, three or four state capitals that does not have a modern skate park. Um, we'd like to, you know, change that. Uh, there are a number of parks being proposed in the state. Uh, <coughs> I think we're lagging behind them. Uh, and as the state capital, we should be leading the way. Um, so that's that's kind of how I feel. So thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Appreciate it. Thank you for all your work. Uh, you. Thank you. Let's we'll go next. Good evening. Um, thank you for all you do for Concord. Um, my name is Meredith Cooley, and I'm here wearing a few hats. Um, the first is as a mom of a 12-year-old, oh, he's 11, but almost 12-year-old um, son who plays soccer with Parks and Rec, which is an awesome program, and get ready for a hard brag. But he, I watched him score three goals on Saturday up at Keach Park, and just to see his confidence build and um, and that smile on his face just just makes my heart burst. Um, he's also on a team with several Project Story um, participants, and they are creating friendships. And it's just great to see see because I live in Ward Five on the other side of town, and um, Stephen sort of said it best when he was up here is that. Keach Park is a place where uh, kids can come together from all over Concord and meet each other. And at this age, um, going into middle school, um, gets to meet kids from other schools as they go into a really hard time in their lives um, into middle school. And, I, and they're also, uh, I'm, just as my personal experience, like I know he's going to be becoming a teenager and looking for activities to do later and later into the day. So I'm here to advocate for Lights Park because I think it's a great way of keeping kids um, occupied and uh, in a healthy way, moving their bodies, um, as well as staying off screens um, and social media. The Sur Surgeon General just um, out, uh, issued a statement, first statement my pediatrician tells me, um, is the first time that the Surgeon General has come out with anything related to pediatric mental health and how um, the, that they're going to be tracking that. And so getting out, playing soccer past in, in the fall and the spring, past the time that the light starts getting dark is such a huge thing. Um, I, also, as a community health nurse, this is just a way of keeping kids active. And when the young adults are working all day, they're not moving their bodies, and this just is good for, um, for uh, human beings. Um, also, putting on a different hat, I am the co-director of Concord Green Space. Our leadership team unequivocally uh, supports um, Change for Concord in their uh, efforts to get le lights at Keach Park for all the things you've already heard today. And I really want to thank the mayor for um, his openness t um, throughout the process. I've been part of um, sort of on the side of watching the process go. He's been... Um, very open with the process since January, so thank you for that. As well as, um, I'm also putting on a different hat. I uh, Charm could not be here. She's the director of Project Story, so I told her um, that I would speak for her if she wasn't able to get here, and she's um, also advocating for these lights to go through. So thank you for all your time, and um, just hope that you all are... Um, going to move forward, so appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? It's all right. I'll skip it. Cool. Thank you. Mr. Swiker. You already come up 
once. Well, all over again, everybody. Let me check my notes. You already here once? Now that you've opened it up to the capital budget, though, gotcha. right. now I've got a few more items. All right. <laughs> and just to prove that someone actually read the whole capital budget, <coughs> I'm first going to discuss item 552, Pigeon Guano, that it's proposed that in 2030, you build enclosures on the I-93 bridges so pigeons won't nest under them. And I'm going to hope that by 2030, maybe something further has happened on that I-93 project and that what you do is insist that the state as part of building it put on their own pigeon guano enclosures so the city doesn't have to fix the new bridges first thing up. So that's number one. Number two, we have an EV charging station proposed for two vehicles at $75,000. And that seems like an awful lot. I mean, what does it take, an electrical outlet? That's cheap. And a wire? That's actually crazy cheap. <laughs> well, if it's crazy cheap, then we can't afford these electric cars. Because I figure if they spend $2,000 a year on gas, and you're paying 75 k for this charging station, you know, that's 20 years of you know, gas you could buy for the expense of the charging station, and that's before you pay for the electricity. If we're going to have a city that has a fleet of how many vehicles we have that all need to be charged electrically, we've got to find a way to bring that cost down below $75,000 because we cannot afford to pay, you know, what does it amount to, you know? $75,000, I mean, that's 20 years of gasoline. That's just ridiculous. We've got to find a way to do it cheaper or else we're going to have to use those gas vehicles forever because nobody can afford that kind of money. I see that you've got an item for the Mamac River Greenway Trail. My understanding was, and I think Dick left, that that was supposed to involve no city money. That it was going to be entirely privately fundraised. So I'm not quite sure why we're putting money into it at this point. Why don't we let those people do what they said they were going to do? And once again, if there's still anybody left for the skate park, I would be interested in knowing whether in any of these other communities where it's a big thing, there's a charge to using skate parks. I know that the people that go do the snowboarding and do the funny, you know, sports on snowboards like they do with the skateboards, you know, nearly all of them are expecting to pay to do the snowboarding. So I'm wondering if skateboarding is the sort of thing that you could have a fee to use the park and that would help to support it. Then we have fire department vehicles. I remember when the fire department vehicles, you know, the big trucks used to be good for 10 years. Now they seem to be down to eight. And that, once again, doesn't seem reasonable to me. A big truck like that, you know, traditionally runs 100,000 miles a year if they're using them on the road. And we certainly don't get anything like that mileage on them. And the same thing that the stuff like the pumps and the ladders, those aren't used most of the time. A lot of the time those things are being used as taxis to go out and help the ambulance people. So I'm not quite sure why these things are, are wearing out so fast and we need to change them every eight years when it used to be every 10 years. Other vehicles are talking about last longer than they used to. So I'm not quite sure why the fire vehicles last less time. And even the ones that you are supposed to last longer, the staff vehicles, it says in the thing that you keep them 10 years, but the ones that we're replacing in item four, I think it is, they're only eight years old. So why are we, something has to be replaced every 10 years, why are we replacing them after eight? It's the same way with the ambulances. They're supposed to be replaced every eight years, but we're doing them in six years. So the things should be made consistent. Either they should be justifying why these things need to be done sooner, or they should be pushing the, you know, replacement out. I understand the big trucks, you've got to order them way in advance, so maybe they got to be in the budget sooner. But I don't think that's true of the staff vehicles. In a staff vehicle, you can go out and buy a similar thing pretty much off the lot if you want to. And the last thing, I'll combine two items. We, I've been trying to get the police body cameras for years now, and they've been shoved off another year, presumably so you could get a grant <coughs> to pay for it instead of having the taxpayers pay for it. And I really think that's what you should do with the lights at Keach Park. You had an opportunity to get a grant to put in those lights. And one thing that once again has kind of only been touched at is all the other night field users are expected to pay for the electricity. So I don't know if Keats Park, you're going to put in one of those parking kiosks where you put in a credit card to pay for your electricity if you want to run the lights another hour. 
how the Keach Park users are expected to pay for it, or maybe they expect they won't, and the city will just pay for it. But when you're putting in your grant, I suggested that you include solar panels to generate the electricity and batteries to store it because you're generating the electricity during the day and using it at night. And that would provide a better solution to everybody if you didn't have to pay for the electricity and it would provide a better solution for taxpayers because they'd only be paying half the cost of this. And so I think instead of instant gratification, you should get that grant that sounds like the sort of grant that's going to win for sure and let them wait a year to get the free electricity and then if you've got the extra money by the body cameras a year earlier, I think that's a much more important thing for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing that, appreciate it. Who else would like to testify? Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm Craig Tufts. I'm a Concord resident. Um, a couple quick things I'd like to, uh, to say. Um, Parks and Rec, uh, I think Concord Parks and Rec is awesome. My family really enjoys it. We always enjoy our programs. They're responsive to the community. We love our parks. Um, really improves our quality of life. So I just quickly wanted to say that. Um, I'm mostly here to talk about the CIP. I think there's a lot of great investments in there. Uh, there are two CIP items I wanted to, to mention. One is the Merrimack River Greenway Trail. Um, I'm very happy to see that in the CIP. I'm really looking forward to having more trail built. It's going to be awesome for the community. Um, and looking at what's in this year's budget, you know, there's uh, the city secured an LWCF grant, and the Merrimack River Greenway Trail, the, the nonprofit organization, wanted to raise the 50% match, which they've done. And with so much inflation lately, there, there's a little bit of a gap. So I'm very thankful that the city is stepping up and covering that so we can get a trail in what was the cornfields and is going to be the sunflower seeds, sunflower fields. So that is very awesome. Um, the other thing, I believe it's CAP 17. I don't know if we have it, the number right, but that's the sidewalks. So, um, you know, the best time to build sidewalk is when the road is being reconstructed. Um, so I, I serve on TPAC, Transportation Policy Advisory Committee, and the Bike Ped Subcommittee. I'm here on my own, not representing the committee. But, you know, we, we talk to general services about that, and, you know, we get requests referred to us, oh, we, I would like a sidewalk on my street. And we say, well, there's a lot of streets that need sidewalks and your street isn't being reconstructed, so, you know, this is how sidewalks get built. Um, so we're, we're looking at these three roads that are in the budget now, um, Airport Road, Pembroke Street, and uh, Chanel Drive. Um, so when people would come to us saying, I would like a sidewalk, we needed side, some kind of metric. You know, is your sidewalk important or not? So we started working with city staff on a way to, to measure it. So we, we said, okay, what's the, how much traffic is on the street? What are the surrounding land uses? You know, a whole bunch of metrics. Um, and we got a pretty good, you know, spreadsheet with all the data. It's, it's uh, not a perfect model, but it's pretty good. Um, city staff ran with it, and we have this awesome tool, and we generated a list. And the 117 sidewalk segments, you know, they came from master plans, a bike ped master plan, public comment, that sort of thing. So Airport Road is number five on that list out of 117. There's a lot of good reasons. You know, the, the neighborhoods, the schools, there's no access, it's a busy street. Um, Pembroke Road, Pembroke Street, um, it was in the top 10, seven or nine? I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and with new affordable workforce housing down the end of that street, that's where <coughs> that sidewalk would be. Um, I measured it, it's about a mile to Keach Park in the community center. So I could see, you know, teenagers being able to walk to the park on that street. It's, it's kind of busy street. I think a sidewalk would be great. Um, you know, Chanel Drive has some good connectivity there. Um, you know, if you are on an office park, you see people taking lunch break, lunch break walks all the time. I think it would be very much utilized. I work down at Horseshoe Pond, lunch lunchtime, there's people walking up and down that sidewalk all the time. Great for your health, getting a little exercise. So uh, I think that's really worthwhile the investment there. And I'm happy to see that in the city budget. And that's all. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Tufts, it's always good to see you. And I appreciate your continued participation on the Bike and Peg Committee. I don't think I've been on that committee for some 10 years now. And yet we still talk about sidewalks and the importance of sidewalks. Um, and I know that when I was on the committee, we were talking about 
accessibility and the accessibility measure of our sidewalks. And I'm um, going to ask the question, we're including the accessibility in the measure of our sidewalks as well? Yes. I mean, when, when a sidewalk is built, it's built to be accessible, you know, to the newest, latest standards. And, you know, another thing that is often done, that TPAP works with general services, is when the roads are being reconstructed, they do what they can to address the accessibility issues along the street. Um, South State Street and South Street were recently reconstructed, and they did a, a great job while they were digging the street up, you know, putting everything together in a way that's, that, that, that's better. So A secondary conundrum. I run into this all the time in uh, Ward 3 and in some of the more rural areas of the city where we might have sidewalk on one road and we often see people walking on the other side of the road where there is no sidewalk because they believe that they're supposed to be walking on that side of the road and not utilizing the sidewalk. How do we educate people that the sidewalk works in two directions? <laughs> I don't know. Human behavior is a funny thing. you know. Um, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to just design and thinking about what's happening. You know, there might be a reason why somebody's walking on the other side of the street. Like maybe they don't feel safe crossing the street, so they're on the other side until they can find a safe crossing. Or maybe it's winter and there's a little pile of snow and they don't want to walk into the street to get around it. I mean, there's a number of things. But I think providing a facility for people to use is really going to improve accessibility for, for everyone. So. Thanks. Human behavior. Can't fix it. Any Thank you. So I have a question for you. You're, you're kind of in the business with your day job. Is that a fair say? Transpor uh, transportation? Yes. I, I enjoy it for some Planning. reason. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think you are 100% correct in, in your uh, comment about the best time to build sidewalks is when you're redoing a road that economically makes the most sense. But in your professional opinion, as well as just being a resident here, um, when, when we build a sidewalk, when the community decides this is, this is the right thing to do, we want to build it, do you think there's an expectation that we're going to maintain it during the winter? Yes. If you build a sidewalk, it, get, it needs to be maintained. Would that you support the idea of adding increased um, uh, employees to be able to do that, as well as equipment and support yes. those things as well? So the general services has, um, which you, you know about in other I'm sure other counselors know about, uh, you know, a, a priority order for, for plowing the sidewalks. They, they start with the, the, the Main Street downtown area. They plow that during the storm. They immediately pivot to the safe routes to school zones. And then they focus on, you know, the busy corridors, you know, your Loudon Road for safety. And then, you know, at the end, they get everything else, you know, your quieter neighborhood streets. Um, and I imagine that, you know, continually take a look at how you do that, you know, make sure it's done well, be responsive to the community, and I think General Services has been doing their best to make that happen, um, and it's worth doing, you know, and that's, that, that, that's my view. The city spends a lot of money plowing the street. I count dozens of times my little street sees a plow truck for the street. You know, you plow the street, you, pl you plow the sidewalk, and, and, it, and it's a cost, but it, it's definitely worth the benefit and the accessibility, especially, you know, year-round and not being able to walk from your workforce, affordable housing to, to Keach Park, I think that would be that would be a big loss, and it's worth plowing. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, my name is Wendy Fallensby and I am a resident of Concord, live in Penacook, and several of my um, things I want to talk about have already been addressed. I want to thank you for funding the programming in for um, the library because I was one of the people who couldn't find it and I was I panicked and went, where's the, so thank you. Um, and I do want to also say that I agree with increasing weekend hours when it's uh, able to do that. I know staffing has been an issue, so um, I think you will see numbers in Penacook increase if you could add some more hours. Right now, we are open Tuesday mornings from 9 to noon when kids are usually at school, and we're open um, Thursday afternoons from 12 to 5. 
so that gives you a couple hours where you could bring your child to the library. So I think if we had a, a weekend time, it would help. And I was going to also add that I think you should add more money to general services, but it wasn't for plowing, but I think that's a great idea. But it was so that you could maintain or have more money to help maintain buildings so that the historical buildings like the police station, which became our library, could um, be maintained and wouldn't go to disrepair. And if in the, and as I read the budget, um, you're doing a study for police stations or in the future, and if you need a substation in Penacook, we have a building that will be available in a year and a half or so, and it actually says police on the door. So <laughs> there we go. So that's, that's what I had to say. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. No. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. With that, we'll close the public hearing. And uh, Mr. Manager, let's do human services, have the public hearing, and then we're going to take a short break. Come back for capital budget. Next item on your agenda is item number seven. And you want to be on page 140, on page 148. Revenues budget to budget are flat. Uh, expenses budget to budget are up $41,000 uh, or five. 5.3% uh, due to wage and benefit changes, including adding hours for the administrative specialist position. The projected expenses for the special programs line is 177000 for fiscal year 23. This is a significant increase over fiscal year 22. The actual, as you can see, for that year was 67000 so 177000 versus 67000 These additional expenditures are expected and due to, and I think it actually may be a little bit higher than that by the time we get to the end of the fiscal year, um, the ending of the emergency rental assistance program in December of 2022, the end of the, or the anticipated, or actually the end of the state COVID-19 public health emergency programs. So on, in March, the end of the additional food stamp benefits. In April, the end of the Medicaid coverage for many clients for Medicaid medication assistance. In April, again, the end of the singles and couples hotel assistance. And uh, this coming month, the end of family hotel assistance. As stated last year, I did not expect the outside funding <coughs> to last forever, so we anticipated this. That's why we continue to fund uh, at, the, at the rates we were previously. And now we're seeing those increased expenses. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Who has questions? Um, I have one, if you, if you don't mind. You notice I just asked Ms. Ms. Williams, just because go. you weren't, you're not going to be late. I was. <laughs> well, you want to sit on the left. Huh? Sure. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Um, so, uh, before I ask my question, I'm just going to start with this. So, I've always, uh, uh, <coughs> maintain that we have some of the best uh, <coughs> employees in our city uh, throughout the, the rival anyone throughout the state and they include folks from general services who are leaders in the state um, but I, I want you to know that uh, oftentimes when I talk to my peers around the state uh, your name comes up often uh, you are one of the most the most respected individuals within your profession um, you are top-notch and we are incredibly lucky to have you so I, I really appreciate what you do for the, the city. Thank you. 
Um, my question is this. When you talk about the core responsibilities uh, for your department, and I'll read it, it says, you know, per New Hampshire RSA 165 colon 1, provide assistance to those who are unable to meet their most basic needs. Basic needs include food, rent, shelter, utilities, prescriptions, um, engine, funeral expenses, et cetera. And so it's always been kind of a lesson. If somebody presents themselves to us, it's our responsibility, as any municipality would be, to, to take care of that individual. Absolutely. So we have a fairly healthy homeless population in our community um, that many of our departments deal with, uh, many of our citizens deal with. And um, we do, I think we do an outstanding job. We heard from the police department the other night the need to potentially add a, a social worker um, to help work with um, populations, uh, sometimes even homeless populations, et cetera. My question is this. Um, what happens when uh, I go to your office, you present me, and, and you have, we have an obligation in the city to, to, to provide something. Mm -hmm. You provide an alternative for me, but it's not something I, I want. It's not so I don't really want I don't want that. That's not my choice. I don't want to do that. Sure. Um, do we fulfill that obligation? Even though if I if I choose not to do it, mm -hmm. have we met our obligation? That is correct. Um, under the RSA also it states that you have to accept any and all uh, resources that we have, private or, or public. So we have met the need. It may not be the resource that you would like, but we have met the need and we have provided you with that resource. Unfortunately, we cannot obligate anybody to take the resources that we have. So because of that, we can present that to them um, and then they make that choice. This is not new. I've been in public service and doing this work for 20 years. And this has always been the case that we present them with an alternative and unfortunately, they'll make a decision that if they want this um, resource or not. It happens whether they are homeless, whether we're looking for rental assistance, it all depends because unfortunately we don't have an answer or a solution for everybody for what they want at that particular time. But that is correct, they have that, work, that, that choice, but we have met our obligation when we provide the resource. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, appreciate you. And thank you for your patience. No problem. What's that? Anybody else? No? See? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to run. Thank you. <laughs> Don't blame me. Okay, at this time we're going to open up the, the hearing on the, public, the Human Services Department. Anybody wish to testify? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and we'll take a two-minute recess. <coughs>
Hey, welcome back. Okay, Mr. Walsh, we are going to cover the uh, TIF and CIP note, uh, CIP. Floor is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So we're going to start on page 196, which is tax increment financing in the budget. Uh, quick overview, the city has t three tax increment finance districts. They are the so-called North End Opportunity Corridor Tax Increment Finance District, the Sears Block TIF District, and the Pentecook Village District. Combined, they are about 333 acres. Um, we are well below the maximum that's permitted by state law, which is about 4,100 acres. Um, since their inception combined, they've created about $120 million of new assessed value. Uh, that's the FY24 estimate. It is up roughly $10 million from the previous year because of the activity out at exit 17, um, the Caleb Pennecook Landing site, as well as the Flatley development on South Main Street in the Sears Block District. Um, with this budget, our total investment this, in the TIF districts is uh, a little more than $40 million. Uh, roughly half of that is our, our TIF funds. The balance came from other sources um, to support that. Um, moving on, um, page 197 to 198 is the North End Opportunity Corridor TIF District. It was enacted in 1998. It is currently scheduled to terminate in 2037. That excludes CIP 18, which is Store Street North. Um, which is to connect Store Street uh, behind the Holiday Inn up the Horseshoe Pond, as well as any investments we might make uh, for the Merrimack Valley Green, uh, Merrimack River Greenway Trail, excuse me, through that area. Um, there are other variables that are also affect uh, when the TIF might be sunsetted. Uh, life to date, it's so far it's created fifty million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in value. Million dollars. Moving on to the Sears Block District, um, page 199 to 200 of your budget. It was enacted in 2003. It's projected to terminate around 2042. Captured assessed value is just uh, a little more than $44 million. Um, the revenues in fiscal 24 are, are $1,179,000. Um, that is uh, um, up slightly uh, from the year before by about $80,000 year over year. Um, the expenditures are about $1.271 million. They're slightly down by about 6,500 from the previous year. Uh, the TIF district, uh, the Sears Block TIF district, transfers about $429,000 uh, to the general fund for admin fees, um, support of the downtown services team, uh, debt service from the complete street project uh, that was completed uh, um, years ago now. Um, and reimburse, reimbursement for past investments by the general fund in the Store Street parking garage project from the early 2000s. There's an itemized list on page 200. Transfers to the parking fund. Um, the, dis, uh, the, the Sears Block TIF also transfers uh, just under $310,000 a year. Um, that's down slightly from the previous year um, by about $8,000. And it really supports um, the parking fund's debt service payments for the Store Street parking garage um, that, that go back to uh, the early 2000s and onward. Uh, the net operating income for the district next year will be a negative $92,000. Um, the fund balance is healthy at $294,000 projected for next year. We currently do not release any captured assessed value or tax revenue associated therewith, um, but we have the opportunity, I think, to start doing that in 2027 when the original debt service for the Store Street parking garage is paid off. Last district is the Pennacook Village TIF district, which is on page 201 to 203 of the budget. It was enacted in 2010 to support redevelopment of the former Alley Leather Tannery site and expanded in 2021 to support uh, the Hoyt Whitney Road intersection project in Exit 17, um, as well as the Canal Street Riverfront Park um, at the former Allied Tannery site. It's projected to sunset in 2044, subject to variables. Um, um, including its future additional investment in the district and uh, growth of tax base. Um, fiscal 24 captured assessed value is about $25.3 million. That is up from $17.4 million the previous year. That's related to really the activity at exit 17 and uh, uh, Pentecook Landing Phase 2. Um, key changes. Um, in fiscal 24, uh, we're going to be increasing the amount of assessed value we release from the district. So last year, uh, was the first year that we released value, and that was about seven, uh, about 10 percent, and it was about one million seven hundred forty thousand dollars that generated about fifty thousand dollars for the school district, Merrimack Valley School District, uh, the city, the county, and state. We're increasing that to 15 percent of the assessed value of the district, which will amount to just under 3.8 million dollars, and it's projected <coughs> to generate about 113 thousand 
for the Merrimack Valley School District, the county and the state, as well as the city. So um, we're releasing value out of, of the district and tax revenues to help uh, the Merrimack Valley School District tax rate um, for the northern part of the city. That will increase over time. Um, we're also making repayments to the Economic Development Reserve for the TIF District, um, and we're going to be increasing that slightly from 25000 in last year to 35000 this year. Um, all these uh, changes do not threaten the viability of the district or its ability to support um, proposed investments in the Canal Street Riverfront Park that are part of the budget this year. Um, budget uh, summary is the revenues are 651900 uh, for fiscal 24, that's up from 451,000 last year. Again, because of the development in the district, expenditures are about 467,000, uh, which is up from last year, primarily for increased maintenance costs for uh, the Hoyt Ridley intersection. Um, the net operating income will be just around $185,000, and the fund balance for the TIF district is about 612,000 next year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. A question on TIF districts, Council Pierce. Uh, which line is the uh, infrastructure improvements, uh, the, uh, the roundabout and like that. Is that embedded in here on the bond payments? It is. It's going to be embedded in the, the uh, principal and interest payment. Okay. And it's also going to be in, embedded in some of the professional services because of, of uh, uh, contractors we use to maintain those, those pieces of infrastructure. Uh, just a follow-up. And the $113,000, <coughs> that's divided between school district, county, and state? And uh, uh, school district, city, school district, county, and state, and it's the exact same proration in the in the, uh, the tax rate that, okay. that we have up there. Yeah, for the but it's not 113 going to the school district. That is, that is correct. It will get a prorated share based on their share of the tax rate. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Cousin Thank you, Ron. Mr. Walsh, uh, the Sears Blocks TIF um, actually has posted a uh, drop in ending working capital uh, last year and projected for fiscal year 24. What do the next few fiscal years look like as our redevelopment project on Main Street comes on board? Um, I think I think the Sears Block TIF actually is, is in good condition. Um, we're going to be seeing the new development at 32 South Main Street, the Flatley project, come forward. So we picked up about a million dollars this, uh, this coming April, this April 1st that just happened for fiscal 24 because of the sale of the property. Um, when that project's completed, it's going to be worth uh, more than $10 million most likely, so that's pretty strong. Um, there's additional development that is being talked about on Pleasant Street Extension, the old Monitor Statesman building, which the council talked about at the most recent meeting. Um, and then you have uh, Mr. Dupree, uh, the Dupree Companies is planning a new, it's now four-story uh, mixed-use building at 20 South Main Street next to the Bank of New Hampshire stage. Um, that one is being talked about for construction later this season, probably in the fall. Um, so I think with those things, those factors that are out there and, and combined with the reducing debt service load uh, associated with the store street parking garage, um, that goes back to uh, 2005, six and seven for debt service. If you factor those two things together, um, that's why I'm optimistic that I think the council in probably fiscal 27 will be able to start talking about releasing um, assessed value and tax revenue out of the district to support the city, the school district, the county, and the state. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. CIP. Yes, sir. So the CIP, um, we're going to be doing it by program area, I believe. It starts on page uh, 248 of the budget. There's a, Well, let me back up a little bit. There's an introduction on, I believe, to page 204. Um, that talks about the overall CIP, its legal authorities, how we select projects. We're going to be starting on 248, though, which is really the capital improvement program by category. Um, just a couple of quick comments uh, to orient everybody. Um, we have 56 projects to talk about, so we'll go as fast as we can. Um, and just right around $22 million of projects. Um, occasionally, I'll mention an asterisked project, which means um, if there is an asterisk next to the dollars that are in front of you, it means they are not being appropriated as part of the budget. It means that we will have to come back to you in the future to appropriate the dollars, and that's usually because the funds are dependent on some sort of a donation or a grant that hasn't been awarded yet. Um, so I'll start off with that. 
Um, Your Honor, if you like, I'll just get right into the projects directly if that's convenient. Airport. Um, so we're going to start off with the airport, which is on page 248 to 250. <laughs> There's two projects which total just under $635,000. The first one is CIP 75. Um, um, it's general airport repairs. It's uh, right around $200,000, and that is to replace the roof on Hangar 2, uh, which is one of the structures that is over off of Airport Road. Um, the second project, the CIP 383, which is the new terminal building, um, $435,000, uh, which is a mixture of federal, state, and city funds. Uh, the city's share of that would be around $21,750 currently. <coughs> These are asterisked funds, which means they're not being appropriated right now. Um, and again, this is for design of a new terminal building and parking lot improvements, and it mimics basically the project that was brought to the council just recently uh, by the Engineering Services Division. Uh, we're carrying it in the 24 CIP just to make sure it's in there um, if we have to keep chasing uh, uh, grant opportunities for the project. That's the category, Your Honor. Any questions, airport? You go. Next one is Arena. Yep. Um, page 251, there's one project, which is CIP 64, uh, $69,325, of which 30000 are city general fund bonds. This is an eyewash station, a roof hatch with a ladder, um, and phase two of ammonia improvements for ice making, which is in response to an EPA mandate uh, regarding that system. That is the project. Questions? Okay. Bridges? Bridges, Your Honor, page 251, um, CIP 518, uh, bridge and dam repairs. Uh, we own 20 bridges um, uh, that are our responsibility as a city. Um, $230,000 of highway reserve funds. Um, 125 of that is the pressure wash and seal, uh, the commercial street bridge, which is over Wataman and Brook, um, which is up near Horseshoe Pond. And um, the Water Street Bridge over the CSX Railroad, um, which is at the tail end of South Main Street um, and going towards Hall Street. Um, we have another $105,000 of additional funds to do work to uh, the Horse Hill Road uh, Bridge over the Kentucook River, um, Hoyt Road over Hayward Brook, as well as Courier Road over Ashbrook. There's $320,000 combined in 2022 appropriated to support those projects. We need another $105,000 to move them forward. And that is the category. Okay, cemeteries. Cemeteries, uh, one project, Your Honor, page 252, it's CIP 587, cemetery improvements. We have 13 cemeteries in, uh, in the city, uh, 516,000 total uh, of that. 450,000 is general fund bond to repair two retaining walls at the Blossom Hill Cemetery on North State Street. And then $66,000 uh, of trust funds of that total, 40000 is to repoint um, um, some masonry at the Pine Grove Cemetery uh, in East Concord. And then another $26,000 to purchase and install uh, around 200 markers for unmarked graves um, at cemeteries. It's a category. Any questions? Okay. I don't see anything on the community planning implementation. That is correct. Uh, in downtown, uh, which is the next category, it's page 253, we have one project, which is CIP 644, which is street tree planting, $5,000 of general fund uh, capital transfer, which is cash. Um, we will be uh, re approximately doing approximately 15 trees. Um, normally, the tree program is tied to with uh, CIP 78, which is our annual highway program. Um, um, we also try to maintain the standard of for every tree that we remove, we try to replace it with two. Uh, that's the category, Your Honor. Any questions? Council Brown? Yes, I'm wondering, uh, because there has been a backlog with the sustainable tree program, or there's a wait list, rather, that if we were to double the amount to 10000 is that something that general services would be able to accommodate? Um, I think if, if there were additional resources, we would find a way to make sure that the trees were planted. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Who determines the type of trees that are planted? Uh, my recollection is that it is the uh, the assistant city planner um, and works with the tree the street tree committee and um, and general services to make those selections and then and it also depends on what we can get for for trees and are available from vendors but that's my recollection. The arborist Thank recommends you. it. Yeah. Um, and economic development. Economic development is on page 254. There's one project. Um, it is the, the CIP 639, which is the full measure and list. Um, this is actually an assessing department project. Um, we put it in economic development because it didn't fit cleanly anywhere else, so this is where it ended up living. 
Um, there are $385,000 in other trust funds that are proposed next year for phase one of two uh, for the full measure and list. I know this was talked about the other night with the council, uh, but again, this is really to go out and do a full measure of list of all 15,000 parcels that are in the city. Um, the last one was done uh, circa 1988 to 1990. Um, the goal is to make sure that we have accurate data for all of our properties and in turn uh, make sure that properties are taxed appropriately and fairly. Um, that is the project. Any questions? So, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, fire vehicles? Fire vehicles, also 254, uh, page 254, one project. Um, uh, there's a total of $1,537,181. The majority of that, uh, almost all of it, is general fund bond, with the exception of a small uh, share of closeout funds. Um, funds will be spent as follows: eight hundred ninety-five thousand dollars to replace the tanker truck uh, for the department, which I believe is twenty-five years old. We generally try and keep that kind of apparatus for twenty years. It's a two-year lead time. I think the city manager mentioned to you during his opening presentation. It serves rural areas of the city without public water, um, and it will be in service for around twenty-seven years by the time it's replaced. $400,000 to replace Ambulance 7, which has been in service since 2019. Typically, we keep an ambulance on frontline service for four years, and then we put it into reserve fleet for four years, so we get eight years out of it total. And then $240,000 to replace four staff vehicles um, for the fire marshal, the two deputy chiefs, and the uh, emergency um, uh, the EMS officer. That is the category, Your Honor. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Uh, Matt, with regard to the uh, the bonds, uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, for instance, with the tanker, there's a two-year two uh, lead time. When are those bonds actually issued? At the time of purchase or now or when the time is right? It's usually based on when cash flow tells us we need to issue it and when the project is moving forward. So it's not unusual for us to delay issuing a bond. We typically sell in January every year. Um, it will, we might in actually um, re sell the bond incrementally. We might sell a piece of it if there's a deposit that's required and sell the balance of it later when the rest of the funds are expended. So just because we are appropriating, you know, $1,535,000 of bonds for fire apparatus doesn't mean they're all going to be sold this coming January. They might be sold a year later or maybe even later than that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh. For a piece of equipment like an ambulance that's four years primary and four years secondary service. What's the bond duration? Um, we would probably sell that for, for five or seven years, something like that. We usually sell it for, the, the maximum we would sell it for is the useful life. So it would be le eight years or less. Thank you. Yeah. That's Thank you. Um, and this is probably handled better by the chief, but I know we've had um, some questions from members of the community. Um, and I know we had a conversation last year during the budget time um, about how we're using our fire apparatus and um, you know my understanding is that most of the calls we're handling now uh, are not related to fires and fires make up a significant a much much smaller percentage of the calls that we're getting um, I understand that we need to have uh, personnel respond but the question becomes how many trips are we utilizing these million dollar trucks for and whether there's a better mean mode of transportation for our uh, personnel to get on site for, for example, a medical issue that doesn't you know, require the fire apparatus? I will defer to Chief Chisholm to answer that question. Uh, good evening, Your Honor and members of the council. Um, the, I didn't hear the full question. I believe it was, is there a better operational way for us to handle certain calls without putting the larger apparatus on the road? Yeah, it, it was basically that. I know we had a conversation, and I understand this year's budget, um, it's, the, it's the pumper truck, which obviously, if it's been in service for 25 years, that makes sense. But I know part of the, the conversation last year when we were investing in uh, fire apparatus was that um, 
we've got these million dollar trucks that are rolling down Main Street to respond to you know a medical emergency and uh, is there a better way for people to get around uh, if you know fires are such a small percentage of what we're actually doing um, I would say unfortunately with our current staffing uh, no because what's very important is operational readiness oftentimes we have medical calls in an ambulance uh, goes to those, but uh, what the general public may not realize is that other members of the crews are needed. Um, these are, if there are special situations where you have to carry a larger person out, it takes uh, additional hands. There's oftentimes other things to be done when somebody's in the middle of an emergency, uh, making sure the stove is shut off, helping them with other things around. So oftentimes we need more than the, just the two people in the ambulance. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is breaking. Um, so we send the other apparatus, and the apparatus we send is the one that is closest, um, normally the district piece, whether it's an engine or the tower, uh, not, having a, you know, not having the engine um, in the central part right now, so the tower would go on those ones. Um, so what happens is we've been doing a lot of studies with response times after, uh, with, with the Ambulance One, and um, if we sent something out that wasn't that main fire piece or the tower, we would see uh, very increased times when the crew would have to go back and get that piece uh, to then respond to the other other call. We are seeing a lot of simultaneous calls. Um, most, I would say, I believe the last data showed about 30% of our calls are simultaneous calls. So that's why we're, we're doing that right now. So the short answer is with current staffing profiles, I can't think of a, a better way to do that. What do you do with the old ones? I, I know that with the ambulance, you put it back and you put it into reserve service. Yep. But what do you do with the one that you no longer have in reserve? Yep, so the, um, uh, a couple of points I'll bring up. I'll answer your question. The trucks that are no longer in reserve service, oftentimes we will uh, trade those in for value against the one that we're purchasing. Um, sometimes if we believe that there is more value within a private sale or a sale that is, for lack of a better term, brokered by the dealership, we can do that as well. So uh, we do try to get value out. Um, the, the other thing with the ambulance that's coming up is it, it says on there, I think that it was a 2019, but um, that, that's not necessarily, this is going to be replacing a spare ambulance because once you authorized the purchase of Ambulance One and we added that new ambulance to the fleet, we had to uh, hold an ambulance back that we were initially going to trade to be able to keep two spare ambulances in service because the uh, spare ambulances were not mechanically uh, able to carry the capacity. So we had to hold on to an additional ambulance. And then once this new ambulance comes, Ambulance 7 comes in, that one will then go away. So the ambulance that's going away has 110,000 miles. We generally don't like to put more than 100,000 miles just because of their very tough service life. So that this is not a fairly new ambulance that this is replacing. So that may be a, a misnomer in the, in the documentation. So the four, um, <clears throat> the four vehicles, four staff vehicles. Um, so, so to replace those, you tell me all of them are 2016s. No, they are. According to the list I have, and if I'm incorrect, let me know here. But I have fire marshals vehicles, the 2017. Uh, the deputy, uh, the two deputy chief vehicles. One is a 2017. The other one's a 2016. And the EMS officers is a 2019. Do you know how many miles you have on those by chance? Um, I, I do. So, um, and this was a uh, something that uh, the city manager and I had um, brought up. Um, uh, somewhere between uh, thirty-five and fifty-five thousand miles on those. But it's my understanding that those are used to then to go to other parts of the city. So these aren't going down the road. To the best of my knowledge, they give them to the fire department to break in, and then they go to other replace other older vehicles within other parts of the city from my understanding. I guess my question to you is, do you think this is the best time to be buying four new vehicles like that? I is don't know. Because you're looking at $60,000 a vehicle to replace something you only got 
the highest one is 55,000 miles. I don't know what effect that would have downstream on the departments that may be expecting those. I don't know what those vehicles are. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Chief, uh, uh, two questions. One, uh, how many of those vehicles leave Concord and go home with uh, the operator at, in the evenings? Currently, right now, four of them, all of them. And follow up, Your Honor, what, what is the criteria for bringing a vehicle home? Um, the criteria for bringing the vehicle home right now, um, the fire marshal uh, during the uh, COVID um, COVID uh, started bringing the vehicle home um, because he responds back to the city for, for fires. And then the, uh, the EMS officer also has a safety officer role and is expected to respond back for fires, whether it's on the weekend or in the evening. And one follow up, if you will. Uh, of those four that leave at night, uh, how many leave the city out, out of town? Uh, those ones, all of them. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Uh, anything more on the fire vehicles? That's it, right? That's, that's it? That's it. Yes, Your Honor. So we are moving to golf. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, category is golf, Your Honor. It's on page 255. There are two projects, uh, about $360,000. Uh, $360, the first one is 235 golf course grounds improvements, $326,398, of which uh, just under $312,000 are general fund bonds and the remaining uh, or closeout, and then $15,000 would be golf bonds. There, this is the ongoing irrigation improvement project. Uh, next year for 24, we're talking about irrigation at the second hole, the putting green, the ninth hole, as well as installing a centralized irrigation control system. Um, the city has been doing, uh, this is a multi-year project that's been going on since 2018, so this is phase seven. Our total investment's been a little bit more than $1.25 million. The next uh, project is CIP 530, which is golf course equipment, $35,000 of general uh, of golf fund bonds uh, to purchase a large aerator, renovator, and cedar to help maintain um, turf in large areas like fairways. Um, the, the piece of equipment will have about a 20-year life cycle. That's the category. Those questions? Councilor Brown? I just want to clarify. So we have spent $1.2 million so far on irrigation. And we're looking at spending another uh, one million eighty thousand on irrigation. Is that correct? Uh, I do not have the out year in front of me, but we have spent a little more than one point two five million to date yes, since two thousand eighteen. Can you tell me what the debt service is on that? That what has already. Um... Council, did you get the uh, response back to your? I did. Uh, I would like it to be in the minutes. I think you're. It is in the minutes because you asked for. I mean, you, we can go through this all the time, but just so everybody understands, you've all got this information. It's about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in total for all of the general fund capital. It's been spent on it's been spent on golf course operations or golf course uh, capital projects so far. How many years will we be paying that that debt service? Uh, this is a twenty-year life cycle, or it's longer than twenty-year life cycle, but it's a twenty-year bond on these projects because of the uh, length of life on the project. It's going to be in the ground. The irrigation is going to be in the ground for four or five decades. Four or five decades. Uh, one of the questions that I had asked in the information sheet was uh, how, how much of the area was uh, irrigated, and I know the golf course is one hundred and sixty-nine acres. Of that 169 acres, how much is receiving that irrigation? I, I, the, the, it's, you know, there's obviously some wooded areas in there. There's parking lots. Things like that. I don't know what that exact okay. acreage is for that, but <clears throat> all of the holes are, are irrigated. Um, all of the uh, greens, all the fairways, all the tee boxes, the um, uh, uh, putting green, uh, all of those things are fully aerated, uh, air, irrigated. Everything that needs to be green grass for golf operations. So it's some, you know, right now we're probably about two thirds done mm -hmm. um, with the new piping. Uh, and then, you know, as you can picture from the 14th hole where the pumps, the pump house is, and the irrigation pond, and we've worked our way back out towards the clubhouse, uh, up along all those holes. So we spent a very 
um, measured approach to how we're actually installing all the new irrigation system, you know, when we pretty much end up finishing up in the farthest areas away from the pump house. Thank you. I'm um, just curious. So the, the pump house you refer to for this irrigation system, that's the same pump house that we'll use to provide uh, snow making in the winter for skiing the beef. Is that correct? If, if that was something that the city council wanted us to pursue, that would probably be the same pump house, would have obviously need work done to insulate it and winterize it, things like that. Got it, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, see. I, I, Your Honor, I'd just like to point out that um, if we were to irrigate, if we were to spend the money to irrigate all the little league fields, that's only 160 acres compared to the 169 of the golf course. I just wanted to point that out. I really appreciate it. Thank you for You're sharing. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. That was really good. Um, is there anybody else? Anybody else want to share? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we're done with golf. We'll move to general services vehicles. General services vehicles, Your Honor. I believe it's on page 255. There's one project. Um, is CIP 121. Uh, uh, the request for fiscal 24 is $1,743,000. It's a mixture of general fund, water fund, sewer fund supported bonds, as well as equipment reserve. Um, uh, we have around 225 vehicles in the fleet uh, that we take care of um, in pieces of apparatus. Uh, we generally keep our heavy equipment for about 20 years. That's our loaders and graders. We keep dump trucks for 15 to 20 years, generally speaking. Sidewalk tractors around 10 years and other vehicles are, somewhat, are between seven and 10. There are 18 pieces of equipment uh, proposed for replacement in fiscal 24. Uh, highlights include $753,000 for four dump trucks, $318,000 for a sledge hauler, $90,000 for a Bobcat Toolcat, and $60,000 for two plow truck sanders. Um, happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay. Commission Technology? Excuse me, I had a question. No, I apologize. I didn't That's say okay. Um, I do the look around. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wilkes, what's the lead time on general service vehicles? Is it the same type of two year wait that we're dealing with as uh, fire equipment? I, I don't know if it's two year wait, but it's certainly not what it was pre COVID. It seems like things are still taking longer, especially for larger pieces of equipment. Anything specialized is going to take a while. Uh, the sludge hauler, I, I suspect, might take a while. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, page 256, there are four projects for a little more than 532,000. Um, the first one is CIP2, which is the Information Technology Hardware and Software Replacement. This is really the IT department's annual replacement program, $330,000 next year, mixture of general fund, water and sewer fund monies. Um, the formula that we use to fund this was revised in fiscal 18. We no longer charge golf, parking, or the arena. Um, there was a financial decision. Um, so therefore, the general fund is taking on a little bit more than it used to. Um, for $330,000 next year, we'll be buying $180,000 worth of computers, hardware monitors. We generally keep those for five to seven years. $40,000 of year-end of, of, of uh, servers, to uh, replace our servers. $10,000 for printers and about $100,000 for various software upgrades. Uh, the next project is CIP 297, which is the, our Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. Uh, $10,500 with a three-way split between the water fund, the sewer fund, and the general fund. Um, each has $3,500. We uh, hire interns with these funds to conduct routine maintenance of our data layers uh, and map infrastructure in the field so we can keep everything as current as we could. Um, it's a valuable resource for the city and the private sector. CIP 302, Enterprise-Wide uh, Information Systems Applications, um, $147,500 next year for a citywide scalable document management system, which will be integrated with our EIP, uh, ERP um, to try and help us with um, uh, just documents in general and data storage. And then CIP 631, which is multi-function protocopy machines. There are 24 copiers uh, in the organization. We keep, we actually purchase them and generally keep them for five to seven years. Um, some of them do get recycled to, uh, if they're lower use to other departments and held on longer. Uh, $44,000 next year of general fund capital transfer to replace copiers in the finance accounting division, the, the code division of community development. Uh, the records and detective divisions at the police department and in fire headquarters. That is the category. Questions? Okay. Uh, intersections. intersections, Your Honor, page 257. And there are a few projects for next year. The first one is McKee Square. Uh, so you'll recall that we started this uh, last fiscal year at CIP 31. 
next year we are requesting two hundred and seventy five thousand six hundred and seventy one dollars a mixture of general fund bonds impact fees and capital closeout dollars um, this builds upon the funds that were appropriated in 23 to start the project. Uh, the intersection was built in 1990 by the Department of Transportation. It was studied in 2012 by the Engineering D Services Division of Community Development um, and found that it was operating above capacity and has significant crash history at the Broadway and West intersection. Um, funds uh, will be used as follows, $23,480 to supplement last year's appropriation uh, to finish up planning and preliminary design, which is phase one of the project, and then about $252,000 for final design and permitting of the preferred uh, design concept, which is phase two of the project. Right now, construction of the intersection is programmed in fiscal 26, and we're anticipating that we're 80% of the project will be paid for at that time by uh, state and federal grants. Uh, CIP 283, it's traffic signals and traffic operation improvement, $60,000 of general fund bonds next year to install accessible push buttons and countdown signals and a control cabinet replacement at the Washington Street, North Main Street, and Ferry Street intersections <coughs> in downtown. CIP 520 is intersection safety improvements, $110,000 of highway reserve funds uh, to reconstruct and realign the intersection of Abbott Road and Sewell's Falls Road intersection which is being coordinated with uh, General Services uh, CIP 78, which is the annual <coughs> highway program. Questions, Your Honor? Anyone? Thank you. Um, on CIP 31, I've had a couple of questions from uh, members of the community as to whether we have a design concept yet for McKee Square. Uh, not that I'm aware of. So it's uh, they were in the process of doing traffic stouts, preliminary planning, uh, uh, existing conditions, boundary surveys, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not aware of, a, of, of concepts yet. Um, our plan will be once we do have working concepts to go out to the neighborhood and talk to them about what those concepts might be. Um, other than uh, there was a concept, I take this back, there was a concept that was developed in 2012 that wasn't uh, state of the city address that the mayor and the city manager gave um, but that was just simply to show people what one concept was that's not the one we're necessarily uh we're going with at this time thank you yep anyone else thank you uh, same project mr walsh um, obviously we have finalization of design and permitting in uh, fiscal year 24 construction planned in 26 um, the delay in construction you know not undertaking that in 25 is that to allow time to vet the project through the neighborhood and to allow for uh, i'm guessing grant applications for federal funds or it, it's both you're okay. right it's it's to work through um the neighborhood uh, 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 community dialogue about the intersection design and then aligning with what we think the grant cycle is going to be yeah comment <laughs> um the council of fantasy the the, two, the 2012 concept design was vetted in the neighborhood and there was a lot of questions a lot of pushback and one of the one of the residual thoughts that we, I shouldn't even say residual, one of the thoughts that we kept hearing is the unintended consequences of a poor design pushing traffic into the neighborhoods, um, which essentially is one of the reasons why it's been put off so long and other projects came forward. So I can tell you, um, I hear quite a bit about it and there's a real mixed bag of people who are looking forward to it and those who are dreading the potential of a, of a rotary, so. <laughs> I believe I've heard the same thing. Years, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Uh, Next category is other vehicles, Your Honor, on page 258. There's two projects. The first one is CIP 569, which is parks and cemetery small turf equipment. Um, there's about 16 pieces of equipment uh, that grounds and cemeteries have combined. $100,000 next year to replace two out front mowers, both are 2008 units. They have a life expectancy of around 10 to 15 years, so they're at the end of their useful life. <coughs> and then $15,000 for one infield pro machine, which is a 2006 piece of equipment, uh, which maintains basically the dirt areas of softball and baseball fields. Um, the next one is CIP 575, police uh, vehicle uh, equipment, uh, I'm sorry, police vehicles and equipment replacement, $280,000 next year of general fund capital transfer. Um, and other sources, um, and we will be using that to purchase uh, four SUVs, uh, cruisers that the department uses. Um, there are about 32 vehicles that are in the fleet. Generally, a cruiser will remain in frontline service for three years and then move to the unmarked fleet for two to three. Uh, those vehicles get used 24 hours a day and people essentially live in them so they have a hard life. 
Um, and that is the category. <laughs> the vehicles talk, or the people? You're about the vehicles or the people. All the above. <laughs> <laughs> All the could, they borrow, could they borrow fires? <laughs> uh, well, we, can, <laughs> we can talk about that. Else? <laughs> okay, moving along. Parking. Parking. Uh, page 259. There are two projects for $120,000. Uh, the first one is CIP 432, which is State Street Parking Garage. $75,000 of parking fund bonds next year is really to do a study um, to review um, um, whether or not there's enough capacity in the parking system to uh, allow us the opportunity to potentially consider demolishing the structure and living in and just putting a surface parking lot. There's a long narrative that's in the in, in the budget, um, which uh, it's going to take into a variety of factors about the capacity of our other parking garages, capacity of the on-street system, um, capacity that might be created by the state's construction of their new parking garage, um, and, and other factors. So that's uh, what that, in, um, th that that's what that project essentially is. Without going into lots of detail, but happy to talk about it more if you'd like. The other project, the CIP 596, which is surface lots. Um, the city has nine surface lots with about 210 spaces, $45,000 in parking supported bonds next year to support design and full depth reconstruction of the parking lot that's out back here by the Audi um, off of Prince Street. It'll include drainage, lighting, and landscape improvements. Uh, we have some drainage issues in that parking lot which have been affecting City Hall and the Audi for some time, and we'd like to try to address those. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, CIP uh, 432, Mr. Walsh, uh, and the out year 2026, and understanding that these numbers are just placeholders, does that uh, $12,045,000, does that represent the potential, underlining potential demolition uh, of that garage and replacement with a, with a surface lot? No, that actually is the number for repairing the existing facility, believe it or not. All right. What would it cost to replace it? So uh, the, basically what we have for options right now are um, to demolish and build a, a surface lot we're projecting would be around $5.2 million. To uh, demolish and replace the existing 240 uh, space facility could be uh, well north of $20 million. And to repair and renovate the existing facility, we're projecting that around $12.6 million. So um, it's, it's a... It's a challenging structure to work with because of its cast in place concrete system, 1981. Um, so there, there are tough options or tough decisions and options for us to, to make, uh, to review in the future here. But, but before we get there, one of the things, you know, given that demolishing and replacing it with a surface lot, which would be around 70 spaces, one of the things we want to look at is if, um, if there is capacity in the system and if we make some management changes for some of our other facilities, can we essentially um, uh, move on without uh, you know, repairing it and actually replacing it with a surface lot? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, uh, Matt, refresh my memory. Some years ago, I remember a number being thrown around. Is it still somewhere on the order of fifty to $70,000 per space? For a um, garage, I don't. Uh, it, it's the the latest numbers I've heard were more in the the realm of the forty forty thousand ish per space. But you know, construction pricing right now is still not great. I think the state's looking for about twenty two five for their new. I think it's four hundred twenty five space garage. Last I heard, give or take. Um, so I uh, no, no, can't do the math off the top of my head at this hour right now. But that's you forty know, to fifty thousand isn't yeah. fair. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as part of the study that's going to be done, uh, will we be exploring whether there's any opportunities, if there is capacity uh, in the system, or, or I guess if there's not capacity, whether there's options to transfer the parking garage to someone else, a private uh, entity that might want to operate it? Um, we could we could explore that. Uh, this garage, unlike the other two, doesn't have any long-term lease agreements that would complicate that. Um, I guess the question is if anybody would want to take on that responsibility and what the impact would be for community and economic development issues in, in, in the downtown area, but it's something that could be explored. Just, what was your question? What was my question? I was reading, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my question is whether as part of the study we would explore if, if there is a market for the, the garage, whether we would explore potentially uh, private entity that might want to purchase or operate it. So we, we actually, um, when I first became mayor, we actually appointed a committee to examine just that. We can pull out that report. They were pretty extensive, and I think it was uh, 
uh, attorney Russell who actually may have chaired it or he was on it, but we, it's, it's, a uh, it's pretty costly to do that. So, but if you want to re-examine it, it's always, I think you had a supplemental report to our report. Probably. Um, okay. Anybody else? Any questions? There's a flashback. I appreciate that. Flashback. Uh, parks and open space. Parks and open space. On page 260, uh, there are, are multiple projects. I think there's four of them. The first one is CIP uh, 51, which is White Park. It's $800,000 for the Monkey Around Playground. $400,000 in federal grants, which is LWCF, um, which uh, we basically have been notified that we will be receiving um, later this fall. Uh, $350,000 in city general fund bonds and $50,000 in donations. Um, uh, you know a lot about this, but I'll tell you anyway. It was built in 1994. It's exceeded its useful life. Um, the new facility will be based on the community meetings that were held over the last couple of years, um, and um, it will be a fully accessible facility with port-in-place uh, surfaces, a wheelchair-accessible swing and merry-go-round, um, as well as an area for folks who are visually impaired and have other sensory issues. These are asterisked funds um, because they're dependent on the donations uh, piece of it. Um, but I hear good things about the donation piece and the Friends of White Park, so um, I, I think we could probably come back to the council relatively quickly about this um, after budget's done to get it formally appropriated. CIP 52, which is Keach Park, $383,775. Um, 375000 of that are general fund bonds and then a little bit of impact fee money. This is design and construction of lighting improvements for a youth soccer field on the north side of the park uh, along Loudon Road, essentially between Eagle and Exchange Avenue. Um, designs around 30,000, construction and uh, in contingency is the balance of the funds. So um, as noted in the CIP, simultaneously with the design process, community meetings shall be conducted to review design concepts, gather public input, as well as develop community consensus on a preferred design concept and use, uh, utilization plan for the lit field space. Uh, public meetings shall include, um, these meetings shall include the public, the city's park and rec advisory committee, the airport advisory committee, uh, park users, including applicable leagues, uh, budding property owners, as well as community groups and other interested stakeholders, uh, in short, everybody. Um, construction is going to be subject to uh, city council review and approval of the preferred design concept and facility usage plan. So we'll be back to you before we start construction. Uh, CIP 60, so you've been thrown a lot of words and a lot of numbers tonight, so I figured I would give you some pictures. Um, so on, uh, in, in front of you, you have two plans for parks uh, that we'll talk about right now. Uh, the first one is Kiwanis Park, uh, it's also known as Waterfront Park, it's $200,000 next year of general fund bonds for design and permitting of park improvements uh, per the January 2023 Merrimack River Recreation and Open Space Corridor Charette, and then the follow-up conversation that happened earlier this spring. Um, what you'll see is, what you're going to get is basically what you see here. Um, uh, the concept's been well received by the community. Um, there's, it even shows potential future expansion of the arena if you flip over the second page. Um, but essentially there's a pavilion, an amphitheater, a children's playground, a new 30,000 square foot skate park that's up in the corner against Loudon Road. Uh, the boathouse uh, for the crew will be maintained. Uh, walking paths, 403 parking spaces, including 88 grass spaces that will be available as needed. Um, and um, out years, uh, the, the construction is currently in the out year of the capital budget for around $5 million, which is a tentative placeholder. And then secondly, the second park project that you have, if you flip the page, is the Canal Street Riverfront Park, which we've talked about for a couple of years now. Um, the request for next year is a little more than $2 million. 1.5 million of that will be Pennacook Village Tax Income and Finance District supported bonds, and half a million dollars of land and water conservation grant funds, which we've been notified that we'll be receiving in, in the fall, and then a little more than $12,000 of impact fees. Um, our total investment in the park, going back to design and funds that were appropriated last year, will be a little more, just under $3.4 million. Um, the majority of the park is being paid for by the TIF district, about 77% of those funds, um, that's what it is. Um, this project has been uh, uh, before the communities going back to 1986 in the Pennacook Village Sense of Place Master Plan. It was carried forward in the 2004 Visioning Charette for the Tannery Site and the 2015 Village Master Plan. It is the final component of redevelopment of the former Allied Leather Tannery Site after 20 years. 
Um, the amenities that you'll see, which are going to be subject to uh, final bidding, is a large pavilion, an amphitheater, a fishing pier, um, a scenic overlook that's perched over the river, a new public parking lot to support the village as well as the park, walking trails, historic interpretive signage, um, and streetscape improvements. Uh, we're going to be improving Canal Street between Village and uh, Walnut and Crescent Street, including a 10-foot wide shared pathway on the north side of the road. Uh, per the pedestrian master plan, as well as bump outs at crosswalks. The project's been reviewed by RPAC, TPAC, the Parking Committee, the Pentecook Village Association is going before the planning board on the 21st of this month. Um, construction of the streetscape improvements, if, if funded, would start uh, probably this July, and the park itself would probably start this fall. Happy to answer any questions. questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Walsh, people tell me my hearing's not what it used to be, so did I hear you correctly say that on CIP 51, uh, the playground, that we have received word that we've received the $400,000 in federal uh, uh, LC, well, I can never remember the... LWCF. But, uh, thank you, yep. LWC, yeah, yeah. So we, we have received word from uh, the state that they essentially told us that there is a 99% chance that we'll probably get these funds in the fall and they're just waiting for the formalities of dealing with the Department of Interior on it. Excellent. Thank you. That's thank good. you, Your Honor. And thank That's you, Counselor. Good. I appreciate the welcome. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Walsh, <clears throat> Project Number 567, Riverfront Park, are we we're aware of any other improvements being made by our neighbors to the north in the abutting space or? <clears throat> to the north. Uh, so I'm looking at Riverfront Park. There's a portion of that which abuts Bosquin. Yes. Uh, are we aware if Bosquin's doing anything with their space or? So Bosquin, uh, 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 my heart goes out to them for a town that's the size of that, that, that they are with less resources. They have been trying to tackle um, um, their share of the former Island Leather Tannery site that is in Bosquin down on Commercial Street. So really kind of going across the other side of the Kentucky River. Um, the other facility that's to the north of that, the old fiber mill, um, has been on and off the market. I'm not aware of anything happening there. Uh, half that building's actually in Concord, believe it or not. Uh, it's a strange town line. Um, but they did just get some EPA funds for dealing with um, some of the structures over on Commercial Street um, that are visible from Concord from the Rivco site, um, and, and, uh, which is a good thing because, uh, you know, as they work to take care of what's on Commercial Street over there, that will help the Rivco site in the long term. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Walsh, we heard a lot of testimony this evening about um, Keach Park and the lights at Keach Park. Um, based upon what you just told us, we don't really have a light design at this point in time. We haven't had public forums at this point in time. There was a forum held over the winter months by Change for Concord, but it was not a public forum, and we haven't done the neighborhood outreach. Is that correct? So th there is a concept that has not been released publicly that was helped, that was prepared by a vendor to help us come up with a budget estimate for this. Okay. Um, I think what you will see uh, if the council wants to go forward with this is you will see an effort by uh, city administration and Parks and Rec to have neighborhood meetings with all the stakeholders that we mentioned um, and to try to build consensus on a design, location, and uh, the terms of how the, the space will be used and, and how that will be allocated among all the various interested parties and including the neighborhood. And then we will come back to you um, at some point uh, in the future. I don't know exactly when, but um, it's obviously a priority. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to, um, once that consensus is developed, to report back to the council to get authorization to proceed forward with construction. One more follow-up. Um, do you think it's possible it would be installed before July of next year. Um, if any, that could be possible, if, uh, if if we can come to consensus quickly, if we have enough funds in the budget, and if supply chain issues are not a problem. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. I also um, have questions about. Uh, Keach Park. Uh, just, I remember when we were discussing uh, the splash pad, and this was brought up, and uh, at that time, uh, Council had decided that we would do the outreach, and we didn't do any outreach then, and, and the splash pad will be open uh, this summer, and there's a lot of people that are going to be consulted about Keach Park lights, leagues, camps, and I'm just wondering, have we involved all those parties um, when we've done any other park uh, changes. It just seems like, 
you know, we are inviting a lot of people to weigh in when this is really a neighborhood community initiative. We have had robust public outreach for various projects over the years. Um, we, we just went through a pretty robust one actually for the Canal Street Riverfront Park, which is a new amenity uh, for the community to make sure we were providing what the community was asking for. I think in this case, uh, where there are so many, there's a diverse group of stakeholders, there is, a, there is a, a, essentially no availability of lit fields in, in Concord, really. And I think there's going to be such demand for this particular space that it really is important that we understand how it's designed, what those user groups think they're going to use it for, and then understand, uh, have come to an understanding of how the, the, the space itself is actually going to be parsed among the various interests that are out there trying to use it. Um, the reason why the Airport Advisory Committee is on here is, um, um, is basically because of, depending on the, the, the final height of these lights and the proximity to the airport, and just to make sure that there aren't any navigational issues related to the airport. The, the runway is about 2,000 feet from here, so that's, that's why they're on that list. Follow up, Your Honor. I, you know, I just see that there are six parks um, that also accommodate soccer, whether it's high school, Division three, or Division two. So when we have these community forums, perhaps we can look at um, the needs of all of these people and how they may be distributed more evenly across the different parks, rather than expecting Keach Park alone to accommodate all of them. If the council as a whole wants to instruct us to do a certain, uh, to do that, we, we'd be happy to do that. But we would look for that direction from the council. Council Pierce, the mayor Porto. Just a quick clarification, uh, Councilor Brown, on the question. Are, were you suggesting that we not include the wishes of the neighbors of Keach Park when it came to installing the lights? Was that the basis? No, no. What I'm concerned about is that we're inviting all these leagues to weigh in on the lights as though this were the only park that had soccer. Maybe if there are so many leagues uh, and so many people that want soccer, maybe we should look at other parks um, and lighting up other ones. Keach Park is a Division III um, soccer park. You know, Memorial Field has two soccer fields. Merrill has two. Rolf, Russell Martin, and White also have uh, soccer fields. I just do not want this community that is so densely populated that we are making it um, the, soccer, the soccer field for everyone. Maybe we need to look at lighting another soccer field uh, for high schoolers. A Division three soccer field is recreation. And this is the community's neighbors have been asking for it. It's not leagues that have, I haven't heard any leagues come forward asking for lights. It has been a neighborhood, um, a community group that has come forward asking for these lights. So why would we invite leagues to weigh in when the the neighbors have been doing all the legwork? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's been one neighborhood group asking for the lights. This is true. But since the lights have been come public, uh, other groups that use Keach Park use that field because that field can also be used for lacrosse practice, black football. So it's not solely used just for soccer. So once the lights became part of a conversation and hit the news, all these other groups that play on this size field during the day said, hey, we'd like to play at night too. Keach Park is a neighborhood park, but it also does, as you know, uh, different sports during the summer, different soccer during the summer. My concern has always been <coughs> once we light up Keach Park, it will become more than a neighborhood park. Yes, there's a group that plays soccer. There's also families that come within the Keach Park Ward 9 and Ward 8 that have picnics in the fields that uh, kids come over, it's a free play park, it's an old school park. Kids come over and you'll see kids with lacrosse sticks, just two kids or three kids just, just playing. Kids just play there. So my concern has always been, once we light up Keach Park, are we making it a secondary um, sports field? But to say no to other groups that once we light this park and other youth groups 
that no, your flag football team can't be here or um, what other what other group? I I don't you know, I, I, legally I don't think we can do it, and I don't think it's fair. I mean the park is for the entire community, even though it's a neighborhood park, and I certainly don't want to lose that neighborhood feel. But at the same time, when groups are asking to light that field, they got to realize other teams and other youth groups will want to be want to be using it and that's why in the beginning um, back in I think 2017 it was actually yes. Councillor Matson and I that uh, made the motion in our pack that we keep two nights a week open for public use in in Sundays and so that's public use it's not just for one neighborhood or one group it's public use two nights a week and it's the only park in the city that does that so not to expect that once lights go up there and there's two nights a week for public use that other youth groups won't come that might want to play a different sport and I think that's why we have to have the public <coughs> hearing so everybody's on the same page is what is being built what the use is going to be and other things like um, you pay for the lights so I think it's very important that we have this public meeting especially since the neighborhoods that surround the park know what's going to be happening in their backyard Close. so let me just say a couple things um, first of all uh, we've done meetings uh, you know I can go back to the uh, Doug Woodward days when we had actual meetings with every single park doing the master plans for each one so this is not a new concept to, to hold meetings and such. But I think it's worthwhile to just take a step back. And instead of talking about specifically the lights at one particular park, I think that there is a gentleman who spoke to, uh, earlier today, Mr. Pelletier, who I think really summarized a lot of the way I felt. And that is that, that we have a field problem in general and that we have to address these things holistically. It's not one off here and one off there. This is what are we gonna do overall? So for instance, um, I am thrilled with the school district who have come forth and said, we are willing to come in and halfway and meet you in the city and obligations to deal with Memorial Field. This is such a huge step forward. We need to say thank you and, un and underscore this over and over and over because Memorial Field is really what we need to uh, address when you talk about athletics and particularly with Concord High School District, uh, Concord School District um, and, and how we use, because a lot of that is underwater. There has to be a real good look at this design-wise, how are we gonna fix those issues? But you also have uh, the issue down at Terrell Park. And do we go ahead and move forth with a field down there? Um, I think you know it may be necessary. What's gonna happen with Runlet? Are they gonna end up, you know, I have no idea, but you know, do, what happens to those fields that are behind Runlet now? So there's a much bigger discussion that I think really needs to happen within the community around fields, and they all fit together. Um, you know, so it's it's not just Keach and user groups and such. I, I think you know, um, if if Memorial Field is done and there's lights down there, that's going to take a lot of pressure off some of those other uh, areas of the city. And I think you know that's kind of recognized as more of the the citywide. Uh, it always has been celebrated as a citywide field. Um, so I, I just think we need to just. Step back, take a look at the big picture, and take a breath. We've always talked to the to citizens. We'll continue to do that and have neighborhood meetings and such. Um, but these are good discussions to have, and um, but we're going to have to be willing to step up and make the investment if we feel it's important. So, anybody else? Okay. Uh, what are we now? We're Public buildings, Your Honor. I think two page page two sixty two. Uh, there are seven projects. Uh, the first one is CIP 65 City Hall renovations, a little more than $376,000 uh, to do $200,000 of HVAC improvements with our interior chilled water piping system, and then $176,000 and change to continue our masonry repointing of City Hall going on phase three of four, which is going to be Green Street next year, the Green Street elevation, I should say. Uh, CIP 252, which is fire station improvements, $80,000 of general fund bonds to replace specialized washers and dryers for, for cleaning and drying our, the turnout gear uh, that firefighters use. 
uh, when they return from calls. CIP 323, which is the uh, Combined Operations and Maintenance Facility, the COMF, where uh, General Services lives with the school district. Uh, mix of bonds uh, supported by the general fund, uh, water fund and sewer fund, $250,000 to replace the boiler uh, up there, which I believe is original 1990 equipment, and then uh, $20,000 for ceiling tile replacement throughout the building. Uh, CIP 484, police station improvements, $200,000 of general fund bond next year to replace the roof. Uh, CIP 551, library maintenance, $150,000 of general fund bonds, $100,000 of that is for HVAC uh, control improvements and then $50,000 for interior finishes, which is really painting and carpeting uh, and the facility. CIP 636, electrical ve electric vehicle charging station, $75,000 of water bonds to construct two electric vehicle charging stations at the water plant. Um, there's design funds last year that were approved, so this is construction. Um, we'll look at grant resources as opportunities allow, uh, to maybe supplement those funds. Next project, CIP 643, which is the new uh, police headquarters, $75,000 of general fund bonds next year to complete a site selection study for a potential new police headquarters away from the campus, uh, City Hall campus. Uh, needs assessment was done of the existing facility and presented to the council about a year ago. Um, if we decide to relocate the police uh, station from the campus, it will give us some long-term opportunities uh, with the campus itself and how we allocate space here as the category. Questions? Okay. Public safety. Public safety, page 264, five projects. Uh, the first one, CIP 376, fire department hose and equipment replacement, $30,000 of general fund capital transfer monies for systematic replacement of hose carried on our apparatus. Uh, the next is CIP 527, fire department EMS uh, equipment replacement, $275,000 of general fund bonds for the first phase of two for replacement of the cardiac units used on city vehicles as well as in city buildings. It's going to buy about 30 cardiac units in each phase. CIP 573, fire department personnel protective equipment, um, $35,000 again of general fund capital transfer uh, for routine replacement of turnout gear used by firefighters. Um, it replaces approximately 10 sets of gear a year. Uh, each firefighter gets two sets of turnout gear. Uh, we try to replace them every 10 years per NFPA standards. Next one is CIP 618, unmanned aerial system for the police department, $100,000 of donations, which we think will be a potential grant for the acquisition of uh, what I'm gonna call a drone um, to support police operations, search and rescue, uh, crime scene documentation, critical incident management, but it also might be useful for many other departments in the organization as well. This is asterisked funds pending receipt of a potential grant. Uh, CIP 630, police co uh, computer crimes hardware, uh, $16,000 of general fund bonds to uh, replace hardware and software used by the investigative computer crime base uh, unit, uh, which is forensic towers and hard drives, and that is the category. Thank you. Um, I had someone ask me the question, will the unmanned aerial system have the capability to be armed? <laughs> <laughs> I do not know the answer Real to question. that. <laughs> I don't know if the police yeah, department. Yeah. <laughs> <No. laughs> the, the answer is no from the back of the room. Yes. <laughs> no? um, so with the uh, the EMS replacement equipment for the um, AED units, mm -hmm. do we pay for those in the past? Uh, I can't recall if any of them were grant funded or not. I honestly what, can't remember. What did Con Concord Hospital donated a bunch? Was that just for City Hall? Honestly, I don't remember. I don't know if Tom does. That, that was originally, but then we've been paying for them as we replaced them. So they started off that they had it. They were able to give us quite a few, but then we decided we expanded it to all the fire vehicles, and we expanded it to all the police vehicles, and so it's it's grown. Got it. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? Next. Next, Your Honor, the next category is sewer collection. Uh, it's on page 267. There are two projects. The first one is CIP 91, which is sewer main replacement re and construction, rehabilitation and construction, excuse me. We have about 141 miles of sewer mains in the city that the city maintains. Um, $1,950,000 next year for this project. Um, 50000 of that is sewer capital transfer, and, and the remaining $1.9 million are sewer uh, supported bonds. Um, the 50000 is for maintaining the sewer, inter uh, sewer interceptor access roads uh, in the area of Ridge Road and School Street. Um, the second is uh, $1.9 million 
for design of the height sewer collection system improvement project. So um, if you were at the State of the City, you might have heard that we have an issue with capacity on the heights relative to uh, literally the size of the pipe in the ground um, and the amount of development that's occurred out there and the age of the system, which in many cases the pipe is 70 years old. Um, so what we'll be doing is designing improvements to um, upsize pipes um, throughout the, the, the heights and uh, Old Turnpike Road corridor and also um, improving the pump station at the Steeplegate Mall, uh, which is a separate project, which is CIP 275. Um, it's going to be a multi-year project. Uh, our total investment in that effort is going to be in the order of 25 or $26 million when we're done. Um, the next project is CIP 275 sewer pump station improvements. We have eight pump stations for the sewer system, uh, $300,000 in bonds to refurbish the pump station at Chanel uh, Drive, uh, which were designed last year. Um, any questions? I want to come up with a question just to make Mr. Hoodley come up here. <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me at the break how much he really wanted to come up and say hi. <laughs> Seeing that, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, sewer treatment is the next project, CIP, two, uh, it's on page 268. There are two projects for a little more than $2.2 million. The first one is CIP 104, the Hall Street Wastewater Treatment Plant. The plant was put into that service in 1981, has capacity of about 10 million gallons a day. It only does around half of that right now, uh, so about $5 million. Uh, $2.2 million in change, um, $650,000 in new sewer bonds, the remaining $1.55 million is sewer closeout funds. Um, we're going to be replacing water piping throughout the plant. We're going to be designing and installing a magnesium hydroxide system, which helps with uh, the plant digest organics to reduce nitrates. $200,000 for HVAC improvements at the administration building, $10,000 for sludge uh, system improvements. $25,000 for sealants and protective coatings on concrete surfaces and piping. $25,000 to replace the security gate, the automatic security gate in the fence. Um, the next project is CIP 466, which is the Pentecook Wastewater Treatment Plant. We do have two uh, treatment plants here in Concord. This plant went into service in 1974. It was uh, went overhauled in 2005. Uh, it has about a $1.3 million uh, million <coughs> gallon capacity uh, per day. and. Um, um, 30% of the volume comes from Bosquin, actually. Uh, $50,000 of sewer bonds to evaluate options for uh, the treatment of material at Pentecook and the potential feasibility of diverting some of that waste uh, to the Hall Street plant uh, in the south end of the city. You mentioned Bosquin. I did. Do they assist in finances for their use of it? They do. Uh, there's an intermunicipal agreement with Bosquin, and they do pay... Uh, um, um, a portion of uh, prorated portion of plant improvements and, and other things through um, through that agreement. So yes, there are funds that come in Thank you. Um, through sewer charges. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, project number 104, Hall Street Wastewater Treatment Plant. In the out years 27 through 31, there's some pretty big numbers out there, um, ranging from five and a half million dollars to one and a half million dollars. What do those projects represent? Oh boy. I mean, there, there's a lot of projects out there. Um, you're right. If you want more detail, I guess this might be the opportunity to have Mr. Hoadley and Mr. Chesley come up, but there are, uh, <laughs> you know, it's any variety of things related to dewatering equipment, structural repairs, um, aeration system improvements, uh, SCADA upgrades, uh, motor control center replacements, um, you know, and you're right, there are, there are some big years uh, out there to maintain the infrastructure in a plant that is built in 1981. Some of the components have been upgraded, obviously, but yeah. there's a lot of money. So just a follow-up question. You said this is like regular maintenance for a plant that's this old. Is it just, is it uh, pre-planning pre to prevent problems, regularly scheduled maintenance on certain equipment? So, so essentially what it is is the part-by-part -part replacement of a plant that was built over 40 years ago. So when you get to things like um, uh, motor control center, $4.25 million, the grit removal equipment replacement to replace that system, uh, $4.2 million, um, water, uh, plant water piping replacement, $2 million. So it's really... It's really those things have just won out. We've gotten the full life out of them. Uh, the federal 
government paid for a lot of those costs <laughs> 40 years ago when the plant was built, but now it's all under rate payers. Thank you very much. Anything else? So sewer's not cheap. Sewer's not cheap. It's getting but, more expensive all the but time. But we made the investment over the years because of the good work of, th I think, the council being willing to make the investment and general services use of the science. How many people remember when you drove into Concord the smell? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is no longer there, is it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. th these investments are really important. To make. And Concord, Concord was the leader in the state and then actually northern New England for doing the combined su sewer operation, you know, uh, separation. separation. So while many communities around New England and the country are still putting raw sewage into our rivers and oceans, Concord is. Councilor Madison. Yes, thank you, Ron. So the, you've essentially said that the building or more or less that whole system is being replaced. Is that building size-wise the right capacity? I mean, are they going to, is there an opportunity or is there a requirement that they may have to increase the size? No, it, it, it's actually, as, as Matt had mentioned, it's uh, operating at 4.5 million gallons a day. So it can know. handle 10. Okay. So we're actually looking, we could use more business. So and that's yeah. one of the issues is that it, you, it's really, for a plant like that to operate the most efficiently, you want to have more usage in it. So actually the activity that's going on in the community is going to be great for the plant. The issue is now is getting that that material to the plant because of the uh, collection system isn't quite adequate enough in all the right places. And remember, there's only so many crossings along the river, so everything on, everything that's going on in the Heights, all that new housing that's going to go on, all that redevelopment of Steeplegate Mall, that's all got to get across the Merrimack River. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to do my part as a producer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, too much we're, we're very long. <laughs> too much information, Counselor. All right, so sidewalks and streetscapes are the next uh, category on page 268. The first one, CIP 17, sidewalk, bikeway, and streetscape improvements. $1,090,000 of general fund bonds next year is spent accordingly. Uh, $540,000 for new sidewalk on Airport Road between approximately Ripley Street to number 184 on Airport. That's about 4,300 linear feet or about 0.81 miles. Um, Airport Road is a major collector roadway and has between six to 10,000 vehicles a day on it, depending on which section you measure, uh, which is a 2022 data point from Central New Hampshire Regional Planning. Uh, it is TPAC priority number five of 117 that you heard from Mr. Tufts, I think, earlier tonight. Um, there will still be a, a small gap, uh, uh, there'll still be gap after that going uh, towards Manchester Street, um, but that's what we're proposing for this year. $400,000 for Pembroke Road, which is Gway Street to uh, Sheep Davis uh, uh, to Sheep Davis Road. Um, 2,700 linear feet or so, or about a half a mile. Um, Pembroke Road is an urban street. Um, it has about 5,000 vehicles a day on it. That's a 2021 data point. Um, as was mentioned in the public testimony, there's a new 127 unit workforce housing project that is under construction, I believe now, um, right near 106. Uh, 195 to 199 Pembroke Road. The sidewalk will connect um, everybody who lives on that street to uh, Keach Park, the new citywide uh, community center, and also the airport uh, office park and industrial park. Uh, it's TPAC priority number seven of 117. The last one is $150,000 for sidewalk on Chanel Drive. It will be just around 1,000 linear feet or 0.2 miles. Uh, it will connect <coughs> sidewalk between Pembroke Road and Regional Drive. Uh, there's about 3,000 cars a day on that section. It was TPAC priority number 58 to 117. Um, just really filling in those gaps to uh, flush out the network up there. Um, the improvements are built as part of, uh, with CIP 78, the annual highway program, and uh, these recommendations implemented city's 2008 citywide master plan as well as the 2017 sidewalk master plan. Um, and there's a map on page 285 if you want to see where those are. Um, CIP 380 is neighborhood safety improvements, $40,000 of general fund bonds. Uh, this will be done um, as part of a partnership with uh, the Merrimack Valley School District, which is underway with their piece of it. Um, I believe that's going to happen later this summer. Uh, it's really to construct a, a sidewalk and some parking improvements um, uh, on Allen Street between High Street and Community Drive. This is very similar to the play that we're making on Dolphin Street um, up in that neck of the woods. It's, it's Dolphin Street all over again, just another block south. Um, um, so that is moving forward and Merrimack Valley School District has their funds and is doing their piece. 
CIP 543 is the Merrimack River Greenway Trail, $700,000 to implement phase two, uh, which is the cornfield section from Loudon Road basically to where the boardwalk would be um, at the wetland by Terrell Park. Um, $295,000 in donations, $275,000 in land and water conservation fund grants, and $130,000 of city bonds, asterisked um, pending receipt of uh, donations. That is the category. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, um, I had a question on 17. Um, the sidewalk on Chanel Drive. Are there any residential properties abutting that? To my knowledge, no. I think they are all office or institutional users. Yeah. Um, follow up. Uh, on the portion that would be on Pembroke Road, I know there's been references a couple times to the development that's taking place there. Was there any discussion at the planning board level about um, the potential need for the, uh, the developer doing the project to contribute towards off-site improvements like a sidewalk? Um, my, rec my understanding is that there was and that the developer had asked for a waiver not to do it and I believe that the, the waiver was granted by the board um, and I believe um, that the conversation was a concern about when the rest of the sidewalk would be built to that development <coughs> and so therefore my understanding is that there is no financial support from that project to help this particular initiative. We're trying to ha handle sidewalk decisions a little bit differently with the planning board these days, but that was the decision uh, that was made, from my understanding, mm, within the last two years. Thank you. Councilor Jim. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, to that point, I was sitting on uh, planning board when we considered that project and we had that discussion, and I believe that that prompted the decision to uh, require uh, or give developers the option to make a payment that would go into an escrow fund to construct an appropriate sidewalk in, in front of their property at a future date if city uh, sidewalk construction uh, you know warranted continuing the, the sidewalk there <clears throat> but I, I agree with you I don't think that they actually made a payment but that's the policy now Solid waste management. Solid waste, Your Honor. Uh, page 269, one project, uh, CIP 380, which is landfill closure and maintenance. Uh, we have 10 former landfills in the city that we maintain and take care of. Uh, $50,000 of solid waste transfer, capital transfer funds next year uh, to do landfill maintenance, um, including tree removal and fence repair at the old Suncook Road landfill. That's the category. Next. Next, uh, Stormwater, Your Honor, page 270, two projects, a little more than a million dollars. First one is CIP 83, Stormwater Improvements, um, a little more than $627,000. 552000 will be used for drainage channel restoration in Abbottville um, near the Hood Plant, um, uh, 360000 of bonds and about 192000 of closeout funds. And then $75,000 of Penacook Village Tax Increment Finance District bonds to conduct an engineering analysis and alternative feasibility study for the partially collapsed culvert over Burnham Brook um, uh, that's within the right of way for the future Whitney Road extension. Uh, the culvert is currently owned by Wynn Waste, um, but it supports a city water main that's on top of that, as well as infrastructure for Wynn Waste. Uh, we are contemplating uh, some sort of a public-private partnership with Wind Waste to replace the culvert in a manner that furthers the city's ambitions for Whitney Road extension, but also um, you know, supports Wind Waste and their goals relative to maintaining their infrastructure, and those conversations are ongoing. Uh, the next one is CIP 656, which is Riverbank Stabilization. It's a new project this year. $400,000 of general fund bonds to study, design, and permit Riverbank Stabilization at Rundles Road. We have an erosion problem with the Kentuckook River at the southerly end of Runnels Road near the Jim Hill River Walk. And then um, we also have an erosion problem at Terrell Park uh, with the Merrimack River um, near the Merrimack River Greenway Trail. Um, so those are in the, pro the, the budget for next year. Construction is tentatively programmed at fiscal 26 for both of those. That's the category, Your Honor. Next. Uh, next one, Street Corridor Improvements, page 271. It's um, one project, which is CIP 36, which is the Manchester Street Route 3 South Corridor Project. 
Um, $300,000, um, $60,000 of general fund bond and $240,000 of state grants um, for, for phase one of the, of the Manchester Street project. This will be for acquisition of rights of way for future wa uh, widening activities for the roadway, basically to move utilities and signs uh, between Garvin's Falls and Airport Road. Uh, design permitting and construction is programmed in the capital budget over from fiscal 25 to fiscal 27. The project's been around for decades. Um, it's in the state's 10-year high, highway program uh, for construction in 2027, and uh, we anticipate that the state will be committing around $5 million of the $7 million cost at that time. Happy to answer any questions. How, how much more acquisition of right away do we have to do? I mean, we've done a bunch. We have done a bunch. I think we, you know, I think we picked up some with banks. I think we picked up some with the Mazda dealership, but I do believe that there's some additional that still needs to be done out there between Garvin's Falls and um, basically the airport road intersection. That's what I think. Thank you. Um, the timing of this potential work in the off years, is that dependent at all upon where thing where the state is with respect to 93 expansion um i don't know if it this i don't know if the 93 project would directly affect that the state 10-year plan is is, um, is a relatively solid document but there's always a possibility <laughs> it could change um so there are various factors that could affect that but but for now it's in the plan so we're feeling confident about it Next. Next. Um, street rehabilitation. Uh, it's page 271. There's one project. Um, it is CIP 78, which is the annual highway improvement program. So um, r round numbers here. The city has around 220 miles of roadway that we maintain and about 116 miles of sidewalk. Um, that's a 2022 number on the sidewalk. Um, there is 3.122 million of highway reserve funds that are recommended for next year. Uh, that is up from 2.655 million from last year. We're going to be paving 7.6 miles of roadway. Uh, we've been expanding, the council has been expanding the investment in roads for many years now. Uh, we have three typ typical repair techniques that we use. One of them is a maintenance overlay where we shim a recently paved roadway uh, that might have been reconstructed a few years ago. There's a coal plane and overlay process where we literally grind pavement and put new pavement on top of it and then reclaim, which we bring a giant road tiller out there and we rip everything back up and create a new road bed and then pave that. Um, we are now working with a new policy for sidewalks that we are now um, expanding our repair of sidewalks when we do the road paving program. Previously, we only really touched sidewalks if we were doing reclaim. We're now doing that if we're doing an overlay, uh, coal plane overlay, which is good. Um, it's a more holistic approach to maintaining uh, the transportation infrastructure in the right of way, which is good for the community. Next year's appropriation, the 3.122 million is going to be spent as follows: $162,000 for drainage repairs, $110,000 for pavement preservation, which is crack sealing throughout the city, $25,000 for emergency overlays as needed, and then $2.825 million for overlays and reclamation of nine streets. Um, maintenance overlays are Abbott Road from Manor to Sewell's Falls dovetails with the intersection project we talked about recently. River Road, the entire length of that in Penacook. Reclaiming will be Airport Road, Loudon Road to number 184. Chanel Drive, Pembroke Road to Regional Drive. Uh, again, that's why those sidewalk projects are in the CIP 17. Lawrence Street, the full length of it. Pembroke Road, the full length of it, which goes along with the sidewalk project. Stickney Hill Road and Millstone Drive, as well as Spillway Lane. And there's a map of all those streets in the CIP if you have questions. That is the category. Okay, see now. Uh, there's no projects in streets, new construction for 24, Your Honor. So the next category would be a water distribution system, which I believe is the final one of the night. So uh, page 272, uh, actually not quite, there's one after this. Uh, I apologize. Oh, don't do that. I know, I know, I know. So saying hold least still get a shot. What's that? You're saying hold least still get a shot. It's never too late. <laughs> All right, the first one, CIP 85, water main replacement. We have about 177 miles of water main uh, that we take care of. 551,000 and change next year, the most uh, of which all of, almost all of its bonds supported by the water fund. We're going to replace 8-inch water main in Lawrence Street in preparation of CIP 78, uh, the road program. And then CIP 244, water main replacement program, uh, 375,000, 250,000 of that is bond, 125 is cash. 
We're going to replace 600 water meters throughout the city. That's $175,000. And we're going to replace uh, $200,000 for replacement of 75 gate valves uh, and associated meters. Um, we have about 2,000 valves in the city that need replacement over the next 20 years. That is water distribution. Water treatment. Uh, this is the final category, I promise. Um, CIP 88 water treatment plan, uh, water plant improvements, $125,000 of bonds for window replacement and electrical improvements um, at the, the Hutchins Seat plant. CIP 114 is Pennacook Lake Dam and Spillway Rehabilitation. This is asterisked $250,000. We're anticipating there might be grant funds to help us with that, so that's why it's in the CIP. But again, asterisked not appropriated. CFP 124 is Water System SCADA Improvements. SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Software. We spend about $30,000 a year on maintaining the system and upgrading it, and that's what it is this year. And then 370, uh, I'm sorry, 347, CFP 347 is Water Storage Tank Repairs. We have five tanks um, in our, our infrastructure. $75,000 for cleaning, crack sealing, valve replacement for the East Concord Tank, which is over near Portsmouth Street. And that is the category the capital budget, Your Honor, for 24. Anybody have any questions over on the capital budget? <coughs> well, I'm trying to kill some time. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that concludes our activity for tonight. Uh, Monday is a holiday. We'll not be meeting, but we will be meeting again on June 1st. Uh, we'll be talking about special revenue funds, including parking, airport, conservation property, Bobbing Loan Golf Arena, Solid Waste, as well as the Enterprise Funds, including water and wastewater. And that will be... I thought I included under CIP, but if you want to come up and talk about it, you're more than welcome. I'll give you two if you want. <laughs> okay. My understanding of the purpose of a TIF district is that you encourage things to be built that wouldn't otherwise be built if you didn't do a certain project. But if we go up to the North End Opportunity Corridor, the Conference Center, Delta Dental, all that stuff is already built. You do not have to do anything more to make those buildings be built. So I propose that you need to close out that TIF district immediately because all that stuff is built and you're not going to get any more built on those particular sites by you know, putting in anything else. And if you want to pay for a connect connection to uh, Sower Street or Commercial Street, fine. Pay for that with additional stuff that will be built by building that road. But if you're not going to get any more valuation by building that road, then why build it? So I think that test just if you've got the money, you could close out that whole thing. Instead of giving two-thirds of the money back to the taxpayers, you have 100% back to the taxpayers. And close that thing out. And as far as the downtown <coughs> district is, we need to quit laundering money through it. We are spending property tax dollars to subsidize parking for out-of-town people on Main Street. We need to quit doing that. We need to make the people that use the parking on Main Street pay for it instead of transmitting hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, once again, taking it out of the TIF district because people think that's not real money, but it's property tax money. You could turn that all back to expenses in the city. And the North End particularly burns me up because two of the biggest property owners up there are people who support education. They're very you know, loud in supporting education, but yet they don't want their money spent on schools. They only want it spent on their TIF district to benefit themselves. So you need to close out the North End one. You need to take some of the expenses out of the downtown one and give them back to the taxpayers now, not wait. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Yep. Just one quick question. Mr. Schweiker, what percentage of out-of-town folks do you suppose support local business? Well, I don't know what support, support local businesses, but I'm merely saying that the people that park downtown should be paying for parking downtown instead of expecting people on the Heights and Pentecook and whatever who never park downtown from paying it. And if the local businesses, you know, pay taxes, sure. Local businesses get a lot more for their taxes than anybody else in the city. So I'm not feeling the least bit sorry for them. We need to increase the parking rates to where they cover the parking expenses instead of essentially paying for it in property taxes. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anybody else want to talk about tips? Okay. With that, we are going to adjourn for the evening, and we'll see you all back here on the...
The first. Two first. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion made. Second, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Have, a, have a great weekend, everybody.